The world is a chaotic and beautiful place, but to take in the beauty, we first have to bring order to the chaos. To do that though, I think we have to take responsibility for the state of our minds and our lives. How do you take responsibility for moving forward? I think the first step is to try and understand ourselves in sort of observable ways, which often we don't do, uh, of taking stock of what is it that I know about myself? Uh, what, do, what am I aware of that may or may not have changed in me? We hide a lot from ourselves. So the idea of curiosity and self-scrutiny tells us a lot, right? It could tell us a lot, but it also tells us that there is so much of which we are not readily aware. So our, our minds are like icebergs, right? With the, the conscious part of the mind above the water and the much larger part underneath, right? So, so understanding ourselves is often a much richer process right? than, than just taking an inventory of self, for example. And, and self-examination includes reflection, talking with others, sometimes psychotherapy, the kind of things we do to, to grow ourselves, right? So reading and learning. So the, the process of understanding ourselves is uh, taking stock in a sort of inventory kind of way, but that's really the beginning. And even that is not easy. Your life is still your responsibility. My life is my responsibility from this moment forward. There are people who can help me. There are people who love me and care about me and you know, people who can take care of me professionally. Like all those things are true, but I'm responsible for myself. And often taking responsibility for ourselves going forward, we have to feel that we can do that, right? I have to not be terrified of taking responsibility for myself or think that, oh, I can't do that, right? I, I'm, I'm cursed and it'll never go well, or I'm incompetent, I don't know how to take care of myself. And I think the way that we find it within ourselves to take responsibility for ourselves is often to release ourselves from the lessons of the trauma. If the that makes sense. Lessons of the trauma? Right. So, so the trauma. The false lessons? Right. Trauma makes false lessons within us. So if I think I was hit by a drunk driver and it's my fault because I shouldn't have been out at night, right? It's my fault I shouldn't have driven that way home. It's my fault because. I got mad at one of my children earlier and, and I wasn't thinking straight after I let that anger come out, right? Then there's a reflexive shame, right? That is telling me that I should be afraid, right? That I'm incompetent, I can't take care of myself, right? Or maybe God has it out for me or fate has it out for me or whatever it may be. And we have to understand that in order to be able to put things in their proper place of, look, something happened to me that I couldn't control. Right, I mean, I'm driving along, I'm being safe, I'm being reasonable, and someone hits me, blindsides me, and you know, I'm really hurt, or now I'm living with the consequences of that maybe for the rest of my life. And the, the reflexive shame of that is, is so strong, you know, probably, because of a combination of evolutionary mechanisms that, you know, if something doesn't go right and a person feels shame, a person is so attuned to that, right? And that may have made sense in um, evolutionary stages of human development. I mean, then that I don't know. I, I know that it's in us, so I can try and think about what the reasons might be evolutionarily. But also, you know, our society is in so many ways absurd, bizarre, right? It, it doesn't tell us very, very basic facts that we need to know. So like traumas happen to us, right? Big and small. And they create reflexive shame. Like we, we observe that, we observe its consequences, but yet we don't say that, right? We, we have a different societal model. That means like, oh, just don't think about it and think about other things, right? Just life's gotta go forward or, or if people don't want to talk about it at all, and then shame and responsibility or fear festers inside of us, right? We, so, so our response to trauma is to hide it away, is to not talk about the changes in us. And regardless of what the biology or the evolutionary aspects are, we know that's facilitated by a society that doesn't understand how to look at it, right? If we thought, okay, there's been major trauma, What's the first priority we as a society have when as a responsibility to that person or even to society of wanting productive citizens in society, healthy citizens, right? It would be to, oh my gosh, we need to wrap around that person. We need to make sure that resources that help that person talk and expre express and understand what's inside of them. Like we don't do that. You know, at most somebody might knock on the door once or, or lock on the phone really once or twice. You want to talk, you were in the hospital, but we don't do that. And sometimes never ever 
is that death or that injury, is that trauma talked about again, and then it festers inside of people and it changes people. And this is what we see when, you know, the, the death certificate I might see of a patient is car accident, accidental overdose. But, but I know that that's not the cause of death. The, the cause of death is the trauma that I, I well know about and, and, and where it drove that person. But it's very, very hard to, to be able to express and to have the help wrap around someone in ways that are just rational, right? In the context of the data we have, it's, it's not what happens in our modern society. The traumas hit away, the problems fester and grow. Okay, so there's uh, a lot of things in there that I wanna tease apart. So one of them sure. is, I've heard you talk about the, in America, we are five times more likely to prescribe drugs for somebody mm -hmm. dealing with trauma than say, or I guess just in general, than in the um, Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And your hypothesis, which makes a lot of sense to me, is that a part of the Dutch culture is taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna contrast that with what you were just saying, where one of the responses that you wanna see society reorient themselves towards is wrapping themselves around that person. Mm -hmm. And I wanna make this problem as hard as possible so that we deal with the person who's listening, who I really want a beautiful life moving forward. I want them to, to actually solve this problem, but I'm going mm -hmm. to assume they can't get other people to wrap around them, mm -hmm. probably partly because they they either before the trauma didn't know how to bridge that gap mm -hmm. or now post-trauma, they don't know how to bridge that gap. So starting from the idea of taking responsibility, mm -hmm. how do we do that in a way where the person is doing it from a position of self-love, not self-loathing, Right but that they can get themselves to a point where then society may be able to respond well, but I wanna first assume no one's coming to save you, right? which is my baseline right. thesis in life, that it is, even though like one of the first things I'm gonna tell people is loving relationships is critically important. However, I think you have to approach life with the belief, no one's coming to save me, I have to do it myself. And so how does one pull themselves out of the shame spiral if others aren't wrapping themselves around them. Mm -hmm. well, the first thing I would say is a person has to run counter current to a societally determined medical system that is not going to change in the short term and that pushes away from health. So we have a medical system that prioritizes throughput, right? And throughput. How fast can I see patients? Yeah, and how, how, many, how many patients can be seen in an hour, right? And how many primary care doctors, I think the lifeblood of the health of all of us, right, are suffering under systems that, that um, think it's reasonable and rational that they're gonna have giant panels of patients and see four people an hour. Mm -hmm. Maybe five if someone else is out sick, right? So we, we shortchange all of us, right? And then we have a system that is based on like, what is the bottom line now? Like, what is the bottom line in the insurance industry, in the pharmaceutical industry? And look, I'm all for health insurance and I'm all for medications, right? But we have a system that is so out of balance that it prioritizes throughput. And because then, speed of like, okay, how, can, how much can I listen to you? Like this symptom, that symptom, let me write a prescription and okay, gotta get you on your way, right? Because I gotta take three breaths, right? After 14 and a half minutes before this, the next person comes in, right? That is understandably, of course, that's gonna rely on heavily on medicines, right? It's a lot easier to write prescriptions than it is to talk to people. Okay, right? so if step one is don't fall prey to a system that's just gonna give you medication and move you on your way, Going back to something you said earlier, which is we have to put things in their proper place. Yes. How do I do that? So I'm not just gonna medicate, but I need to understand how to put things in their place. So let's say I'm following what you've said. So I'm looking at myself, I notice the changes. I'm gonna try to pull myself out of the death spiral by mm -hmm. putting things in their proper place, but I don't know what that means. So yes. what is the proper place for trauma? So I think, a person is best served by taking stock of what's going on inside of them, which doesn't mean that we have to understand ourselves and what the trauma has done to us, right? Because that, if that were there, the person would probably be in a different place, right? Like there's, there's fear and confusion and like things aren't going well, right? So it's, it's taking stock of that and recognizing what level is it at, right? If it's at a level where a person really doesn't wanna be alive anymore, is having suicidal thoughts or plans, then like that's the time to figure out, like I need to go to a hospital 
right? And, and if I go to a hospital and, and I'm sitting there for 12 hours in a waiting room and no one is coming to see me and I can't take it anymore, like I have to go to another hospital, right? So, so we have to be perseverant in getting what we need because as you said, no one's gonna reach out and help us, right? So we take stock of what is it that I need? So in the situation where life may be at risk, okay, it's a hospital, right? In other situations, we can also take stock of what our resources are. So for example, if you have insurance and you just call the insurance and they say, gosh, we're so sorry, something awful has happened. Uh, there'll be a therapy appointment for you in seven weeks, right? Then like, you, you have to be the squeaky wheel. Like, you have to fight for that, right? You have to fight for what is owed to you, right? Like, you, you have insurance, you should be getting help, right? Let's take that as a basic premise. If the help is not helpful, then you have to fight for yourself. Do you have baseline beliefs that you want the patient to believe in. So for instance, you're worth fighting for. No matter what happened to you, you're still a valuable human being. Absolutely, 100%. And if you're not sure if you're a valuable human being, whether you can link it to something that happened to you or not, that is a reason to get help. That in and of itself is always a reason to get help. And we're all valuable human beings, right? So if you're questioning that, then yes. You look around you and say, what help is there for me to get? And if there is no insurance and there is no resources, then a person can try and understand, like, what is it the community can provide, right? There are often resources that may come for free or very deeply discounted through, for example, religious organizations or other charitable organizations, right? There are helping people in the world. Again, they're not easy to find, right? Or they can be, that it's not, they're not easy to find. But if we, if a person says, like, look, I'm not accepting what's going on in me or what's happened to me or that that's, this could be going on in me and there's nothing for me, right? Then, then we need to look at what's around us, investigate, think, ask, right? Because we need to guide ourselves to help. As you said, no one's gonna come take responsibility for us. Like we don't live in a society that functions that way. And often if you go for help, you get something that's not helpful, right? I think if someone comes who's very unhealthy and overweight and out of shape and starting to have cardiovascular problems. And they, they come and see a physician and they walk away with three prescriptions and don't change their habits, right? I mean, think about that compared to someone who goes to a physician who has more time to sit down and talk to them and say, look, here's what needs to change in your life. Which is why other societies, it's a reason, but right? other societies use less medicines than us. But, but it also sheds light on how we throw medicines, we throw short-term solutions or alleged solutions, right? Like medicines don't solve trauma, right? Can medicines help with symptoms? Can medicines be in your corner as you go to fight something? If before trauma, you didn't have panic attacks and now something happened and you're having panic attacks, well, medicines can help with that. And that's a great use of medicines. But the idea that I'm gonna take stock of you and say, you are a person who has panic attacks, I'll give you medicine to not have panic attacks, and that's the end of the story, has it fixed anything, mm -hmm. right? And that's why when people don't get better, which the system then says, oh, the person failed the intervention, right? It's now we even use that terminology, like, oh, you failed this kind of therapy, you failed that kind of medicine, like, how about we failed you? in how many ways, and it's not reasonable to think that, that people would get better by and large or en masse with the help that we give them. So we have all, all these statistics, right? They, they tell us nothing except the fact that we have a broken system that isn't actually looking at people. If we invest in people in the long term, well, people get better and society gets healthier, right? I mean, we know that from, even from the perspective of education, right? Like early childhood experiences, trying to avoid early childhood trauma, getting education to people at stages of life where they can really take in uh, the, the hope and, and possibilities of the future. Like we know this makes sense. It doesn't any less make sense when we're talking about our own health as individuals or as a society. Okay, so if I am um, obese and I come in and I'm, I have a heart condition, the habits that I would put people on, exercise, better diet, uh, looking at biomarkers in order to make sure that we're moving in the right direction, like uh, body fat percentage, uh, blood sugar, uh, lipids, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So it's, it's a pretty known cascade of things that one should do. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes with trauma, is there a similar set of habits and changes that they would need to make? And are there markers that are objective that we can look at? Yeah, so it's not quite as 
straightforward as, you know, for example, taking blood and then, you know, getting certain very clear biomarkers of internal states and potentially of biological change, right? But there are absolutely markers. And, and the markers become evident if you sit down and talk with someone, right? So, so one example can be a defensive structure, right? We all have defensive structures, which, which define, like, how do we navigate the world? Like, what do I have to arm myself against the slings and arrows, right, of a world that brings a lot of, of difficulty, right? And what we see sometimes is a defensive structure that, for example, changes after trauma, right? So w one example is one aspect of a healthy defensive structure is sublimation. So, so I'm feeling something that's very, that's distressing, but inside I, I want to turn it into something that's productive, right? So I, I have... I feel like aggression and some anger and frustration in me. And you know what? I can take that out in the gym and it helps me be healthier, right? It's like that, that kind of thing, right? And you can see, oh, if, if you and I are sitting down and talking and you're coming right for help, right? Presumably that's why we're sitting down and talking, right? And you're telling me that you're depressed. I'm saying, okay, like I want to understand the details because I don't know anything from just that. Right? Now let's say we start talking and I start learning more about you and I see like, wow, your defensive structure has really changed. You know, you're telling me about a lot of adaptive ways of responding and now maybe you're acting out more, right? Or maybe using a substance to soothe, right? Or maybe using denial or avoidance. And, you know, we start to see then, oh, there's changes in a person. And look, this is not what happens all the time, but the vast majority of what I have taken care of over a long time, over two decades of doing this, has been created by trauma, whether it's depression, it's substance abuse, it's panic attacks, it's interpersonal violence, right? It's coming from trauma, so we don't always identify traumatic change. And it's not always dramatic, right? It can be the accumulation of smaller traumas, like denigration, being seen as less than over and over and over and over again. But if you really want to understand the person, you often learn exactly this, like defensive structure has changed. The person is different. They see their hopes and prospects in a different way, right? And, and, and here's the key. They often don't know it. Trauma happens, changes their behavior, but they're not conscious of the change in behavior? Well, it changes us inside. Mm -hmm. So like, behavior is a manifestation. Do you mean physically right? or like, it, are we talking about it lays down new neural pathways or are you talking purely uh, either a frame of reference, which we'll probably need to define or behavioral? Sure. So behavior is just the final manifestation, right? So w the changes we say are psychological. You think, okay, what does that mean, right? Everything that's psychological is biological, right? I mean, our psychology arises from our brains. Our, our brains are composed of cells and fluids and rather the same as the, the rest of our bodies, right? We, we're composed of neurons that are firing in incredibly complicated ways across incredibly complicated systems and that changes, right? So, so this is not um, a Pollyanna assertion that like everything is trauma and we're going to pay attention to it and we're going to get better. It's based in hard science. And, and I'll give you two examples. So there may be two pathways. I'm simplifying, right? But, but, but it's, it, this is really kind of how it goes, right? Where there may be two pathways inside of me if something negative happens right to me and one pathway could be like, damn it, that's not what I wanted, but like I'm going to bring myself to where I'm going to do it better. Right. Another pathway could be like, what a loser you are. Like you never do anything right. Right. Look, I've got both pathways inside of me. Right. And what determines where the energy goes, right, is is how the linkages are between the neurons in those pathways. So if something happens to me and I feel very, very bad about myself, you know, it starts to foster the negative pathways, right? Or if I've said five hundred times over, you know, compared to 30 times down the other pathways that I'm a loser, what's wrong with me? Like th that's where the energy is going to go mm. because those neuronal linkages are stronger. Like it's, it, it, it's neurobiologically traceable, right? Down to what happens. I mean, we don't understand it completely, of course, but we understand the changes that happen within us. So yes, it's psychological because it's neurobiological and, and that's how it, it is behavioral. It's ultimately neurobiological, then psychological is a manifestation on top of it. And then that determines our behavior. A, a, an example that is even more stark is that traumas can determine how old we are. Okay, so you may think like, what does that mean? Like my, my birthday is my birthday, right? okay, your birthday is your birthday in the sense that you're always going to have a birthday and we can always calculate forward and say, this is how old you are. 
Does that really tell us how old you are? By the calendar, it does. But I don't really care about the calendar compared to my body, right? I mean, my, my body's determining how old I really am inside, right? And and it, after major traumas, there's there's great research that shows us that there is an increased aging in cells. You know, research into telomeres. Like this is aging science, right? Tells us that if you've had very significant trauma, the cascade of problems neurologically, biologically, endocrinologically, mm -hmm. from the, the top of your head to the tip of your toe, means, you know, you might be 45, but really 52, right? You might be 65, but really 70, right? But like, that's real, right? That's true. If you look at, at measures of aging, without major trauma, you can back map to how old the person is, basically, right? But with major trauma, that person got older, that very, very terrifying. And the fact that um, depression specifically, I don't know how linked it is to trauma specifically, but depression mm -hmm. predicts an increase in heart attack, which is crazy. Right. So I, I wanna stay on this idea of putting yes. things in their place because as I think about the habits that somebody that has encountered a trauma would need to imbue in their life, me as a lay person, the things that I would tell them to do would be, uh, first, I wanna eliminate all the biological things that might be causing this. So you're gonna wanna clean up your diet. So mm -hmm. just going to the biological knock on effect of shortening your lifespan, there's just realities to be faced around inflammation would be a big one. So I'm gonna target things that cause inflammation. So stress is one of them, so let's get you meditating. Uh, diet is another, mm -hmm. let's clean up your diet, which we'll call whole food, low yes. sugar. Um, getting sleep, getting sun exposure. But the tricky one, and the one that is gonna keep you in business forever is how do I conceptualize of the trauma and my role in it? You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. What I want to understand is you you get somebody who's just had an acute event. Mm -hmm. In fact, your your book opens, the intro to your book was written by Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. And she said she basically woke up in your presence and was like, whoa, I, I'm being told I just had a psychotic break. And I assume from all the pressure of performing, because I think it was while she was on tour. And in that moment, how do we begin obviously it doesn't need to be with her, so you're not talking specifically about a person, but do we first need to know exactly what happened? Then do we need to know how they think about what happened? Do they, we need to then understand how they think about their role in what happened? And so for instance, my instinct would be to get somebody on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but I've heard you say that it's maybe not the solution. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to understand how mechanistically Mm -hmm. How do we put things in its place? Like what are the beliefs that you try to imbue people with? What I'll call the frame of reference. So mm -hmm. your beliefs and your values, essentially. Your beliefs about yourself mm -hmm. in the world, your value system about uh, how you ought to be and how the world ought to be. Would be the only way I would know how to attack yeah. this problem of getting people to put things in the right place. Yes, okay, I will speak to that. But I, if it's okay, I'd like to speak first to, you had said, okay, there are things you can do. Right, like you can get the basics, right? Of start taking better care of yourself, right? Have a better diet, start exercising, meditate, right? And then the tricky one is this, the psychological one, right? But I would argue because of this one, they're all tricky, right? It's not easy to change one's diet, to rest better, right? Because to exercise they're more, emotionally to take care of dysregulated. Ourselves. Right, you, you have to think that one, you're worth it and you can achieve it. Right? And after traumas, and again, it's not necessarily major traumas. So it can be the trauma of denigration over time, the trauma of being seen as less than, whether that's interpersonal abuse in one household or it's it's societally determined, you know, through how people are seen and, and can be then oppressed through how they're seen. So so it can be dramatic, it can be non-dramatic, but it doesn't matter. Like if the end point is that that person maybe doesn't see themselves as worth taking care of 
Or if they do think, hope oh, maybe they're worth taking care of, it's not going to be okay anyway, then those things aren't going to happen. And that's very, very common. It's very, very common. Now, when, when, in the worst of my traumas, I still had my car serviced all the time. You know, I, I get my car serviced every six months. I want my car to break down. I want to take care of it. Yet I was flogging myself into the ground, right? Because I valued the car more than I valued myself. Oh. Right? And that's not uncommon. Do you mean that literally? Or is that just like one of those, uh, you're a conscientious person and you know that you ought, going back to value system, you ought to take care of this thing that you spent money on and it's just going to shorten the lifetime. That feels like conscientiousness in play more than that you right. actually value it more than yourself. I could be wrong. Well, so where the, the conscious and the unconscious right, are different, right? And it's the unconscious that matters. I and mean, if you had come to me in that state of time and said, hey, do you care about your car more than yourself? I would have said, absolutely not. Like, it's a thing, right? But then it would have been interesting, right? If, if someone next, you know, maybe my, my future self could have gone back and said to myself, well, that's interesting because you're behaving exactly the opposite. Like you don't actually care more in the sense of like care meaning something, right? Because you're not taking care of yourself anywhere near like you're taking care of the car. So, so what's conscious is different from what's unconscious. Now that's a period of time where I felt a lot of responsibility for my brother's death. I felt like, oh my God, like I'm depressed too and what's gonna happen to me and I couldn't see a future. And my brother died by suicide. And, and after that, when I think about like, that was a period of time where I took way better care of the car than myself. And I would have told you, of course I wouldn't do that as I was doing exactly that. Why? Because I didn't think I was worth taking care of. I felt uh, such a sense of shame over what had happened and what it had, how it had impacted my family. And then also, I thought even if I can get myself to think, well, there are people who love me who think I'm worth taking care of, like it's not gonna be okay anyway, right? He and I were very similar, we looked similar, we act, acted similar in so many ways and I, I couldn't see how life was, could possibly be okay. So this is the evil of the trauma, right? that it, it takes away right, the ability to, to see ourselves for what we're worth and also to see change. Because I didn't think about myself that way before. But I was not aware of, there was no curiosity in me or even awareness that like, whoa, you, it is all changed. Like, was it always true that you were never worthwhile and you were never gonna get better? Were you wrong before this? Did something change now and you think differently? You know, I, mean, I ended up getting myself some therapy, which was very, very fortunate. And I think it just required, if my memory recollects, you know, is that it was just basic therapy to help me understand things because I understood nothing when I finally got to a desperate enough place to like call the number on the back of the card and whisper that I needed some therapy because I felt ashamed of that too. So, so in order to get to the point of Hey, how am I going to navigate my life forward? How am I going to understand what's going on inside of me? We have to get over those initial hurdles. So I, I, I didn't mean to not address the question, but I wanted to go back to that. because you, you, you were talking about, well, what happens in therapy? Someone's sitting in front of you, but almost always, not always, but almost always think about the selection, right? For somebody to be sitting across from me talking about this, right? I mean, they have to get there, right? So, so there has to be some thought of, you know, I'm worth it, I'll get myself there, maybe things will go okay. Many people don't always think that, but, but there's so many people who are never sitting in front of someone because our society doesn't help or teach us what I think we should be helped to understand and taught even as far back as elementary school, right? Which is like the, how the responses happen in us, all right? And, and how we can change without knowing it. We can hide ourselves away and we can think differently about ourselves, but we don't teach that. So tragically, but what would we teach? How, how would we teach them to think differently? Well, we could engender a curiosity about self and we could teach directly. So just one example is bullying, right? Like people who are bullied very, very often, the vast majority of the time do not get any education or understanding about like what is going on, right? So that who is doing the bullying, like why? Why is that person responding in ways that allow that person to say feel powerful, right? 
by belittling someone else, right? That like there's something going on here where the person who's doing the bullying has some deficit of self, right? And is trying to make up for the deficit of self by, uh, because that person is a foot taller, being able to thump the person who's not a foot taller, right? Let me ask you, because this will get to the heart of what I want to better understand. Uh, kid comes to you, he's being bullied. Do you send him to therapy or MMA? <laughs> well, so, I'm not a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'll see people as young as about 16. But but the best guidance you know, get a 25 year old then that's being bullied. What mm -hmm. I, what I want to understand is are oh, we see. trying to make the person more courageous and more likely to stand up to the bully, or are we trying to help the person look inward and um, understand themselves? Because I really want to get to the thing that people need to do if they're in this situation. Right. Well, it very much depends on the person. Right. So, so think about there are people who could go to MMA and learn a lot of defensive skills that make them feel less afraid, uh, that maybe let them self-assert more in, in reasonable ways. And like, that's really good for that person. And if called upon to defend themselves, maybe they do a better, do a better job of it than they would have, right? But you could see how other people would go to two MMA classes and then get themselves killed by, by confronting people, right? Or utilize the ability then to perhaps learn something and be violent, right? To then enact the bullying. I mean, people do that too, if there's not a, enough self-knowledge, right? So, so like, who is the person? What will they gain from that, right? But understanding ourselves better is always a good thing, right? W which is why that's what we're, we're trying to understand, right? It's, it's a process of trying to understand oneself so we can understand not just what has gone on in me, but what are my steps to changing that? Mm. Yeah, that's why I want to understand. So what cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. Uh, was a profound find for me mm -hmm. in terms of the sense of you need to pattern interrupt. So mm -hmm. if you're repeating something, you talked about this earlier, you become what you repeat. Mm -hmm. If you're repeating something negative, you have to pattern interrupt that. You have to one, recognize that you're doing it. Two, you have to interrupt it. And then three, I have found, mm -hmm. if you replace that with something empowering, you, you just feel differently mm -hmm. in, instantly. And mm -hmm. this is, uh, to me, this is all a game of neurochemical management through mm -hmm. the adjustment of your frame of reference. So what you believe about yourself, what you believe about the world, what you value in yourself, what you value, think should the world should mm -hmm. value. And so as you take control of your thoughts, which is the very thing I would be trying to get mm -hmm. somebody to do, you take control of your thoughts and then you put in something that allows them to recontextualize themselves, radically recontextualize themselves. Mm -hmm. So from victim to um, hero, I don't know what the exact word to use is there, but certainly of your own life, um, that feels like where we would want to head. But, um, so before we get to the but, what's your take on cognitive behavioral therapy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it useful for this moment of getting people to recontextualize themselves in the trauma? Yeah. So I'm not against cognitive behavioral therapy. I think it is a great tool in certain situations, and it can be a great tool in combination with other tools, right? But it is not a substitute for understanding. And cognitive behavioral therapy it happens to lend itself to boundaries around the therapy process. So the idea of, okay, we can package like 10 sessions of CBT, right? For uh, something that's afflicting a person. So, okay, 10 sessions of CBT for depression, right? But you know, maybe depression is amenable to 10 sessions of CBT and it can get better in some way, but maybe that person needs in-depth trauma work. Like where did depression come from? Like what's the manifestation of the depression? Th there's so much more to understand and the packaging of CBT as it's gonna solve all the problems really because the packaging lends itself to cost containment and throughput is a huge problem, right? Very often CBT is used to polish the hood when you need to get under the hood and look at what's in the engine. Right. And there are people who can pretty readily back map. Like, like you said, if you can use CBT to interrupt negative thought processes, right? And then you're inserting positive thought processes that you're not just making up that are true, right? That, that, that then call your attention to the, to the facets of you that are the ones you want to feel proud of and the one you want to utilize going forward. Like, that's great. 
But one, you have to come up with that. What are you putting in its place? Why are you putting in its place? What does it mean? People can back map to that, that right, I'm changing from a recurrent self-denigrating negative thought that has no place in my life to, to redirecting to what really I know is true about me. Okay, it may be that some people can do that, right? But many people don't, right? They, they don't back map to, to the understanding from the CBT process, right? So, so the idea is, yes, CBT is a tool. Like there are many, many, many tools. And whatever we're doing, if we're in helping professions, let's have all the arrows in our quiver, right? And CBT is a great arrow to have in the quiver. It's not a substitute for understanding. It's not a solution to everything. But because it's packageable in a system that values throughput and cost containment, it gets used for too much. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I don't know if there are stats on this, but if you know, I would love to know. Are smart people more or less likely to commit suicide? I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. To In that. your practice, what's your guess? Who's more amenable to treatment? People, because when you talk about like understanding yourself and all of that, I worry that one of two things is going to be true. Either people that have a higher intellect are better able to do that work, or people that have a higher intellect are more likely to become neurotic and looping because they can really understand deeply all the ways that they're a terrible person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know which is true. I think, I think a reason I don't know the answer to that is at least in my practice, intelligence has not been a, a, a direct variable for suicide. So intelligence is important. Like, do I wanna understand how intelligent someone is? Absolutely, right? But it's not where the money's at, so to speak, right? Yeah, what is uh, the, the predictor? So can a person connect with other people? Hmm. Is a person so lost in themselves at times through depression, through misery, uh, through anxiety, in many cases through trauma? Are they, are they in themselves in a way that is so blocked from connection with others? Right? Is if, you, if you look at how we help each other, it's through the people that we are, right? There have been enough studies done showing that you put a good person in the therapist's seat, that person can help people through different modalities, right? Because they're doing something more than, oh, I'm deploying this modality, that modality, right? They're, they're employing themselves through a modality, right? But in, in order to do that, why, why do that, right? Because you're trying to connect with someone, right? And often what happens in the therapy process is something called positive projective identification, which is the idea that if you feel so ashamed of yourself and so hopeless and so afraid, right, that you're shut down inside of yourself. And we can develop some rapport and some trust and some ideas and thoughts can pass between us. And my real and true belief that like you can be okay, like you're not cursed, your life doesn't have to go down the tubes. Like, oh my God, I see more qualities about you than I could shake a stick at that are great ones. Like if, if I, like I see that and I know that and I learn that from you, if we can be connected, then the person can take that, start taking that in, right? Along with understanding of, you know, if you didn't feel ashamed of yourself before the trauma and now you do, let's talk about why, right? That's not because you're weak or because there's something wrong with you, it's because you're human, right? So if understanding and trust are built, then that positive projective identification means the person takes in how you feel about them, which is how they can feel about them, very often how they did feel about themselves. Now, I didn't come out of the womb thinking that my car was worth more than me, right? And I didn't think that when I was growing up. You know, there were people who loved me. I felt good about myself. And so, so th there was something in me that I could then get back to of like, right, like you did feel differently, right? But often we need help through understanding measures and through human connection measures. That's what's important. If you tell me, what do I want to understand? I would not ask, you give me three questions about somebody or, or, and I'm trying to help and guide them. It, wouldn't not, it would not be how smart are they or intelligent. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be that. But I, I would certainly ask, can they, are they empathically attuned? Can they connect? What are the other two? Oh, you know, they would all be about sense of self. You know, is this a person who has had, who has had stable relationships over time? Right? Because it tells you a lot about a person that like they can connect. They, they can have a give and take. Right? It's, you know, I don't know what exactly what those three questions would be, but I'll, I'll tell you, they would, they would be my best effort to discern down to 
um, understanding that person's ability to have positive internal states, mm. right? I mean, that's what I would be looking for because that's what would tell me, where do I think at least at first blush, can I really help you, right? Or like, am I really worried where I, I might think, oh, is this a person who, um, who I might more direct towards a higher level of care, right? Sometimes if I see someone and- What's a higher level of care? So, so maybe someone who has, who has suicidal thoughts and I'm trying to understand like, should they go to a hospital uh, or, I mean, can we really do this outside of that setting, right? And, and a lot of that is determined by, do I feel like we can really connect, you know? Mm. And, and like, it, that's so important because that's what makes all, that's what makes all the difference and it's not because you want that person to like stay alive because now you're their doctor so it's not that right it's because someone else really seeing us not recoiling from us you know i i had some surprise that that therapist wanted to see me even though like gosh this thing had happened that was so awful and shameful like i remember having thoughts like that and you know how many people have said to me like they're surprised that i don't recoil mm -hmm. when they tell me about the death of their child when they tell me about being raped, when they tell me about being denigrated and bullied over years, and they're surprised I don't recoil because they've internalized the shame of trauma. And even someone not recoiling, let alone someone having just a human reaction to, my goodness, right? I'm so sorry. It, 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 let's, I wanna help as best I can, right? Th that makes a difference, a huge difference to people. And it's that that we want and need if we're gonna help. That's maybe the most uh, insightful thing about trauma um, I've heard. The idea that this really is about connection. Um, I would love to hear, and I, I fully understand this, if we gave you a week to think about it, these would not be the three questions, but I'd love a third question that helps you understand somebody's internal state, mm -hmm. whether they're capable of positive internal states. I would want to get at if that person is aware of or in touch with the goodness inside of them. So do people normally break down sobbing at that point and say there is no goodness left inside of me? Like I can just imagine real trauma. Usually it's something not asked directly, right? But if I were, let's say we're talking and I'm worried about you, right? And I'm trying to understand and I want to, and I say, okay, gosh, I see that there's an ability to be empathic, right? Because we seem kind of connected, right? And there's a warmth in you that I can see when we're connected, or even if you're very sad or depressed, you know, you're, I can tell you're responding to me in ways that read my affect. And, and I sort of learn that about you, right? I think, okay, there's something really positive, right? And then I also then learn that you've been able to have some relationships over time. So, okay, these are good factors, right? I wouldn't ask directly about goodness in you, but I might say something like, actually, things have been so difficult, right? And when's the last time, like, you really felt warmth or helping from someone towards you or from you towards someone else. Now, I might be interested in both ways, but I'm most interested in that moment, maybe maybe in that moment in, have you, are you able to do things for others, right? Because there are people who see that, they're, they're depressed, they're, they're terribly distressed, but they still understand inside of them that they can do good things for others. You know, they can still care for that child. Uh, they can still go do productive work. They can still volunteer somewhere. They still know that, oh, you know, somebody, you know, somebody fell at the grocery store and like broke something. I, man, it's, it's terrible. I helped the person up. Like, okay, you see that there's something in you, right? And it's that awareness of, of goodness inside of oneself because like someone who doesn't feel goodness, they can see someone fall and go the other way. Not because they're a bad person, but because they feel like they're going to make it worse if they get closer. Like, what I got to keep my badness away from that person? I'll trip and fall on them. You know, I mean, I'm you know, I'm putting words to something that are just a feeling, right? But, but I don't think those those things are not exaggerations after two decades of doing what I do yeah. for a living. Like, they're real feeling states inside of us. So I, I would want to understand that too, because if those three things are intact, then I'll be much more likely to feel like. Okay, we can we can have a plan. We can you know things things can go forward. It, it, it decreases my worry, and also in situations that might not be that worrisome, right? For it might tell me like I really think that things can be a lot better. You know, I start to have a read, and I also while I'm or having that conversation, I'm also coming into some touch with what you know about yourself, right? Because there are plenty of people who tell me about the longitudinal friendships and family relationships they have it over years and years while they're telling me that nobody cares about them and there's nobody in their life, right? So, so you know, you learn from what people overtly say, but 
don't rely on the part of the iceberg that's above the surface of the water, which is also the message to the person that's sitting at home. Like if we don't just know ourselves by thinking about ourselves. It's not how it works. Our brains don't work that way. Talk, write, learn more through other means. You know, that, that's important because if you think we know everything about ourselves, it's often the reflex shame, it's the reflex negatives that are telling us that, but that's not the truth. All right, so somebody that really though does believe that nobody loves them, uh, how can you convince them otherwise? Well, we have to understand their life, right? Like we have to, to understand that, right? Like, is that really true? I mean, sometimes it's true, right? I, I wrote a story in the, in the book that I wrote about a, a person who had Cotard syndrome who thought he was dead. Yeah, that was Because crazy. no one had cared for so long that he was alive. Wow. I mean, it was so just terribly sad. And he was gregarious and like funny and nice. And he's exactly the guy you'd want living next door to you, right? But he'd just been alone for so long that it was true, right? Now, there's a different set of things to try and do then. Not everyone who isn't in, in that place it has Cotard syndrome and thinks they're dead, right? I mean, there are ways we can start talking about the goodness inside. If I remember from person. the book though, you weren't able to convince him that he was alive. No, once a person gets to that point, which is by and large through the literature, because it's the kind of case one might see a couple times throughout a, a, a career, right? then it's very, very difficult once a person gets to that point. But it was an, it's an extreme example. That's so enlightening about the way the brain works. I want to take a second to linger on this. So the book's called Trauma, by the way. Read it. Fantastic. I think people think they're misunderstanding what you're saying. He actually thought he was dead. Like he yes. knew, hey, I'm here, I'm in your office, but he thought it was absolutely comical, like actually comical. He thought it was funny that you were trying to check his heart. So he's like, right. I'm already dead. Like, what are you doing? Like when they take me away to the morgue, right. are you still gonna come and try to check my yes. heart? Ha, ha, ha. That's really true. And yes. But the punchline is this guy never stops thinking he's dead. Right. And the fact that, okay, one, if you take an infant and deny them right. physical affection, they die, which is already weird. But the fact that as an adult, you've already lived some enormous portion of your life, you know how the world works, and you can become so profoundly lonely that you end up believing you're dead and your body hasn't caught up, which I don't even understand how they make that logic work, but they do, that this happens enough that there's a name for the syndrome. Right. That's which, by the way, it's not really logic. Bananas. It doesn't work in logic, right? I mean, I'm dead and I'm talking to you and have a heartbeat. That's logically impossible. What do right? they? Would but you let them listen with the stethoscope to oh, hear their own no, heart? No, because logic doesn't matter when logic runs up against strong emotion, right? Like logic never, ever, ever wins. So logic says, "Hey, you're alive. I mean, you got a heartbeat. You're talking. You're you know, you're having lunch, right?" Um, but if emotion says that you're dead, it doesn't matter what logic says. Never does it. It's never logical to run into a burning building. But if someone you love is in it, you know people run right in, right? Like, like logic doesn't matter when emotion is stronger. Those feel very different to me. So I will say that frame of reference is what makes the person run into the burning building because they, like you said, they love somebody inside of it or they want to be the kind of person that runs towards danger to help other people. Like that I get. Now, off camera, we were talking about frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Frame of reference for me is very much a mix of biology, so evolution and your own beliefs that you've taken control of. So I think that one's very much an interplay mm -hmm. of we mm -hmm. probably have an instinct to protect people mm -hmm. in our tribe already or certainly our family. And then on top of that, if you layer like that's the kind of person I want to be, mm -hmm. um, I can see why somebody would do that. But Cotard syndrome where your brain is trying to understand why you are profoundly alone. Mm -hmm. It is trying to understand why it is in just a profound amount of pain. Right. And it suddenly goes, oh, I'm dead. And I don't know if it reaches for that because it's even more painful to think you're unworthy of love no. or it's even more painful to think I have chosen to live my life in a way that's so dumb, forgive me, I know the audience is freaking out right now, but that this is what I'm saying, they would have to think that I've lived my life in a way that's so dumb, no one wants to be around me and I can't bear to take responsibility mm -hmm. for that. And instead, the brain, instead of embracing those very simple, straightforward solutions or reasons, it says, oh, you're dead. That, that to me is an insight about how the human mind works, that anybody that wants to live life well needs to understand that's what you're up against. That's how weird your mind is. That like, 
one of my favorite stories. If you destroy somebody's ability to generate uh, long-term memories, so like the movie Memento, mm -hmm. you walk into the room, this is a real study. You walk into the room, mm -hmm. you meet this person, doctor puts a pin in their hand, they shake their hand, it pokes them, it hurts, they jerk their hand back, why'd you do that? They leave the room, they come back, the person, the patient does not remember meeting them. They reintroduce themselves. They stick out their hand to shake it. The person won't take their hand. Right. But they don't remember why. But when you ask them, they will make up a reason. Yes. They will say, oh, people that wear white lab coats, I never shake their hands. Right. I don't shake hands on Tuesdays, whatever. Yeah. The brain will make up the most ridiculous reasons and I don't think that this only happens when you get all the way to Cotard syndrome. I would say people are dealing with this all the time. Your brain is coming up with the dumbest possible reasons and we are blind to it. We don't realize it's our brain making shit up. Yes, it is happening all the time, but the similarity, so, so I, I would argue that there is uh, a very strong lesson to take forward from the burning building example, the Cotard's example, and the example you just gave of the person who doesn't, uh, doesn't make long-term memories, right? Which is that logic does not matter when it comes up against strong emotion, right? So really strong affect, feeling, and emotion, limbic things. There's logic things in our brain and limbic things which are basically about emotion, right? So in the first example, the burning building example, the idea is to, it, the reason I use that example is to make it something very immediate and very strong. There's not time, like you see the burning building, right? there's not time like what kind of person do I wanna be like? That's a logical process that the brain does not have time to do, right? Logic says building, burning, run other way. Emotion says person I love inside, run towards, right? It's like, it's, that's, that's what that's happens very, very rapidly. What logic said does, says doesn't matter. And the person runs towards the building. Right. In the Cotard's example, it gets more complicated because there's there's actually a um, there's a verbal construct. Right. There's an idea of I am dead. Right. So the thought is then, OK, how does a person logically come to that? Like, I must be dead because I haven't lived a good life or and it just no, it's like the logic doesn't matter. The person believes that they are dead because they feel dead inside of themselves, they can't find any life, right? Oh, if if life brutal. comes from, the person has a memory of like, what what is feeling alive feel like? Like for example, this this man had a memory of like being a, a kid and like people holding him, like he, he knew that existed, right? But he didn't have it in, an adult, in his adult life for years and years and years. And and he didn't have a pet. He didn't be like, oh, I can, I can love a, an animal, right? For various reasons, he was just alone. And then the life drained out of him. So, so the question, I mean, I think the ontological question about Cotard syndrome is, was he really dead, right? If, if that was all gone, the things that make you feel alive, then is it really true that there's no life in him in the way that matters? Like in the, in the limbic, emotional way, I feel no life, right? It, is that more powerful than, oh, my heart, you know, my heart stops beating, you know what I mean? My heart stops beating, so I die. So what is actually going on there is is the, the primacy of emotion inside over logic. And you might say he was gregarious, he was fun, so there was life in him, but he couldn't see it, he couldn't anchor to it. So his feeling of I am dead because nothing happens, but he could be socially facile, he didn't feel it inside. So in the sense that most matters, he was right. Dude, that's the most brutal thing I've ever heard anybody say. That is so gnarly. When I was reading the book, I was like, God damn. Now, I can't help but be fascinated. So if I'm right that this ultimately is about radical recontextualization, that you have to get the person who believes nobody loves them or that they are unworthy to, uh, if it's based on trauma, to re-understand the trauma. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, in this guy's case, the trauma is very slow. It's a very slow, long duration drip right. of just nothingness. Yeah. Uh, could we give him MDMA and take him to a uh, uh, old folks home? I don't know, somewhere where there's going to be people that would be so excited to talk to him. And suddenly it's like, oh, my God, I feel so connected to these people and I can share my wisdom and they can share theirs. And whoa, like they're hungry for my attention. I'm hungry for theirs. Could we get him a puppy? Uh, like, would there be a way, even if it had to be pharmacological, where we could 
change his state so dramatically that he would feel alive again. Like, don't you secretly want to kidnap this guy and find sure. out? Sure, absolutely. Do you think it would work if we did the I, MDMA old folks home puppy combo? I think yes. I cannot imagine that it wouldn't work in somebody. So isn't it worth trying with everybody, right? I met this man in the hospital. A day in the hospital costs a, a lot of money. Mm. He's in the hospital for a long, long time. But I had no ability to do anything except give him two weeks of medicines when he left. I couldn't prescribe, hey, attach him to an old folks home. They, they will make his life better and he will make their life better, right? Get him a puppy. Let's get him out in the, let's get him out in the world. Have somebody go and talk to him all the time. Like I, as he could talk a lot when I sat down with him, I just didn't have time to do it for, for long. Mm. Let's do that, but we couldn't do any of that. We could spend thousands upon thousands of dollars having him in a useless hospital stay, but, but we weren't gonna do anything to actually help him. So we just sent him home to the same loneliness that he came from. Could we do better than that? Yes. Is it shameful? Some shame is, is warranted. Is it shameful as a society that we do not? Yes. So coming back to the guy with short-term memory loss, the doctor with a pin in his hand, they greet, doesn't remember, but he still comes up with a logical explanation. What is the, the unifying thread there? If I'm understanding mm -hmm. correctly, it's just that when you have such a strong emotion, everything else just right. pales in comparison. Right, so, so think about that. What an amazing example it is, right? If I can't make long-term memories and we meet and shake hands and there's a pin in your hand, like that feels bad, right? Logically, I might think I gotta, okay, I see who you are and like, I'm not gonna trust you anymore, right? So, okay, but as soon as you walk out the door, the logic goes out the window, right? That's why, you know, that what seems like a ridiculous, what's called confabulation. Oh, I don't uh, trust people in white lab coats or it's Tuesday and I don't, you know, the person saying something, we say it's a ridiculous explanation or is it that it just totally doesn't matter? Right? What's the difference of why, right? I, I know what I need to know. The logic doesn't matter. The emotion tells me what to know, which is don't shake your hand the last time that hurt, right? So think about that. Even the back mapping to a, a ridiculous logical explanation doesn't really matter because the logic doesn't matter. What matters is the feeling, mm. right? All right, radical recontextualization. We put drugs on the table, mm -hmm. certainly talk therapy. Yes. Um, this feels like it's just an incredibly nuanced, difficult thing to do, but I would love to know if there is a standard procedure to get somebody who does not believe, who doesn't believe the things that would allow them to have a positive internal state again, mm -hmm. how do you get them back moving in the direction of that without drugs first, and then we'll get into your thoughts on how drugs can be useful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the first step is assess, like, do they need drugs, right? Like if, sometimes if people are very, very depressed or having three panic attacks a day, I mean, I can't, we, we can't do the therapy part together, right? So, so with the presumption being the drugs aren't needed, right? Which most of the time they're not. We don't need medicine most of the time to get that person to a place where they can to access their internal state. Right. Then we come at it again. The idea is to have all the arrows in the quiver, right? Which is why you, you are referencing some of the novel medication arrows, right? And pathogens and psychedelics. And we're learning so much more about how can they help us, right? But even putting that aside, we're now thinking about the therapy arrows, right? There are different routes of approach to different people, right? Some people are very intellectualized, right? And then I might say, okay, the next time we're meet, gonna meet, I might think or might say to you, let's like really talk about how it works, you know? Like, it's, it's like super interesting, right? Like how our brains and our brain biology works that like tells us often how we feel, right? Like, so, so you're telling me like how just awful and ashamed of yourself you feel and how different and, and like, right, I felt the same way, right? Because we're human. Right, so like, let's talk about all this human stuff that goes on inside of us, and a person might like really love that, right? Because when it's true, it's real, and it starts to chip away at, like I feel this way because there's something wrong with me, or there's something bad about me, right? There may be other people who are not interested in that at all, not able to follow that at all, and then I might choose a very, very different route, right? So if you're telling me, for example, that you're unlovable, right, then, I might be interested, okay, I'm, I'm thinking in my head from some of what you told me and you know, you did say something, you said some positive things about 
in elementary school, like right. So, so let me like feel around that more, and then maybe you're going to start telling me about, you know, some teacher who was like so lovely to you and like so supportive, even though things were awful at home. Like now you're telling me that you are not unlovable, right? But I'm getting there through curiosity, right? It, it, it's going for what will be most helpful based upon who that person is, because w- what am I trying to do is come at ultimately the false premise. Right, that you're either cursed or unlovable, or things will never go well, or things go well in all facets of your life, but it will never be that way professionally, or things go that way in all facets of your life, but you'll never have good romance. Right, like well, we're trying to come at false lessons, and there are going to be different routes of how to get there, different maps, right, for different people, depending upon the idiosyncrasies of them and of what's happened to them. Mm. But it sounds like at least. Um I have an emerging understanding that there is some universals at play here, which is uh, trauma leads people to get into a point where they no longer believe the things they need to believe in order to have a positive internal experience, that in order to get them back there, I am going to have to find a way to get them to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. And it seems like extreme isolation is always going to be bad that there really isn't which i wanted there to be but i whatever's true is true Uh, i really wanted there to be a way where somebody even by themselves even if nobody ever wraps themselves around them that they would be able to um, leverage their frame of reference in order to build a new belief system about themselves the world and values such that they could earn their own respect and get moving in a positive direction right but it's some people can right some people can do that many cannot so do we leave behind the many who cannot i mean it's a societal choice right Mm. some people can do what you just said but it's a tall order you can be pretty smart and pretty worldly and have a lot of friends and a lot of resources and totally not be able to do that let's talk about san francisco so san francisco is and look i'm on the outside of this i'm a headline reader i want to be very clear uh but having said that it looks like compassion gone wrong it's when you societally just want good things for people you want to love them uh but you never hold them accountable you never ask them to do anything and so instead of saying stop doing drugs on the street you give them clean needles and i get why that feels like a compassionate thing but it seems to create more people on the street doing drugs not less well the idea of giving someone something without any accountability that's not that's not compassion right that's self-indulgence right compassion helps people, but it also helps them help themselves, right? Even if you're just kind to somebody in the moment, like you hope they'll take that kindness away, even if you're not gonna see them again, right? So, so clean needles absolutely can be compassion, right? If it's one su- re- reduction of suffering, right? M- maybe, so, so needles that are dirty spread illness and illness can spread to other people who haven't used the needle, right? So, so there can be broader societal reasons, right? There can also be, look, we want to help you not get an illness that you might not recover from, right? While we're also trying to help you take a path where you don't have to be on the drug, right? So, so it's like, what is actually being done for someone, right? If what's being done for something is something that feels good for the doer, even if that doer is a society in the short term, then all that is, is self-indulgence. And you might say, well, if it puts a roof over someone's head for a night, okay, great. Yeah, that's better than the roof not being over their head for a night, but does it really matter when it's not there the next night, right? I mean, real compassion helps people help themselves, right? It doesn't just leave them flat. And I think that's the difference in a lot of what we do, like think of it fits with the short-term mentality of, it is something for you, right? Like I was compassionate, I feel better about myself. It fits with the rapid throughput with the, you know, four to five patients in an hour for the internal medicine or family practice doctor and overuse of medicines, right? Because we don't stop and stand back, right? I mean, the thought was, we have a medical system that's spending how many thousands of dollars a day to hospitalize my poor patient with Cotard syndrome. We're going to we want to buy him a dog too, right? But maybe we could have saved like 95% of that money and done what he needed, right? That would help others. But like we have to have a conception that doesn't have this kind of narrowness of blinders on and sees people in a societal context, sees our health in a psychological, personal, and societal context, whether it's physical health and mental health. And if we don't do that, the narrow frame of reference, all those blinders on, uh, combined with cost containment and throughput, ends up, it ends up with good throughput, right? But it's not making people healthier and it's ultimately not containing costs. 
It's very interesting. I want to go back to isolation. In the book, you talk about um, there was a guy that was in solitary confinement for 20 or 25 years. I mean, it was something absolutely outrageous. Um, what yes. does somebody yes. who's had that kind of isolation, what happens? The, the story, I think, was, was actually someone who one might have thought from all the socialization would have taken a different path than he, than he took. He took a path of kindness and help when absolutely everything he'd been taught would tell him to do exactly the opposite. So that, that it was a story of actually like that there can be human beauty even when society is pushed so far against it. And of course he bore responsibility for many of the decisions in his life. So I'm not taking responsibility away from him, mm. but he still found goodness and made a really big difference in someone's life and then was so happy with himself because he hadn't hurt anybody. In fact, quite the opposite, he'd really helped someone. The, the idea of someone who's in solitary confinement for so long, and again, this isn't the place to try and think about what are the criminal justice elements and all, but really what you're talking about is isolation. And other than certain states or conditions that, that are sort of clinically relevant, but not found that often, right? This, basically, if we put those things aside, we are not built to be alone and to be isolated, right? We are built to be interconnected. And, you know, that's always been an issue for humans one way or another, mm -hmm. are we too interconnected and then that there's more conflict between us or can we be on top of one another but not interconnected? Like, you know, the aloneness that people describe in big cities where, you know, people are amongst other people but alone. So, so you know, th there are many ways in which this can occur geographically or psychologically, even if not geographically. But ultimately it is about having connection, right? It is about feeling connection. And if you're deprived of that for one reason and whatever the reason may be, if you don't have it in your life, we begin to lose what, what animates us. You know, we're built to be generative, right? We're built ultimately to try and make things better in the world around us. That's why we can nurture children. And, and you know, if we see a child on the street, we can help someone else's child too. Like there are many, many ways in which we're built to be interconnected and to make the world around us better. And if someone takes that away from you, right, th that is awful. Probably, I've often thought that, my patient with Cotard syndrome was so gregarious, right? If he were built with less of that, you know, and say he felt uncomfortable around people, I don't know, maybe this wouldn't have happened. What do I know, right? Maybe he would have read a lot of books and felt some sense of, of living through, you know, adventures he was reading, I don't know. But, but he wasn't built that way. Like, you know, this was a guy who like loved seeing me each day just as he loved ribbing me about the waste of my time. Like he was built for something he, he didn't get for far, far, far too long, which is why he didn't feel alive. It's like, it's never good to have that isolation from human connection and from human goodness, right? Flowing from one and to one. Hmm. All right, did you see the movie uh, Castaway? I did not. Oh my God, you have to see this movie. I, so, I don't see enough movies, I know. Uh, I said, I'm gonna say no to that and you're gonna go, oh, that's what's hilarious. wrong with you? No, but the great news is, <laughs> should you make the time, you have a real treat. So uh, Tom Hanks plays a character who ends up getting stranded on a deserted island mm -hmm. and he is isolated, if I remember right, for five years. Okay. And it's really fascinating. As a screenwriter, you have to find a way to make that interesting. And so a character not talking, it's just gonna be way harder for them to show emotion. It's gonna be harder for the audience to really latch on and pay attention. So they come up with a really great gimmick, which is that um, he ends up, there's a volleyball that washes ashore mm -hmm. with him because he's in a FedEx plane that crashes. Mm -hmm. And so a bunch of the FedEx items wash up, one of them's a volleyball. and he ends up putting a, a like print on it to make it look like a person and gives it mm -hmm. like a smiley face. Mm -hmm. And he ends up talking to mm -hmm. it and really developing a relationship with it. And while that almost certainly was created as a device for the screenwriter to find a way for Tom Hanks to do something that the audience could relate to, it's also pretty insightful in terms of what you would need to do to keep your sanity if mm -hmm. you're in isolation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, if you knew somebody was going to be on a desert island or unfortunately maybe more likely in solitary confinement, what are things that they could do? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. reading, let's say that that's off the table. Is journaling something like talking to yourself, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. remembering positive memories? Like mm -hmm. how would you have a person make themselves resilient to isolation? Mm -hmm. I'll answer that, but I got to say, I swear this is true. When you said the movie Castaway, an image came to my mind which was Tom Hanks holding that volleyball, right? And they say, okay, I'm a psychiatrist, so that's, maybe the, that's exactly the image that would come to my mind. But I think that a reason for that is maybe that was publicized and all, but, mm -hmm. but, but also 
Because when I think about like Castaway and Prisons Lost on a Deserted Island, I think the lack of human connection, like that's what's most important, right? Like the volleyball is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's perhaps how the person survived by being able to conceive of and in a sense bring to life an other, right? Which is why journaling, which when we're writing and or speaking, there are different things that happen in our brains that reify, like kind of make things more real. So it is good to talk or to write as opposed to just thinking. And it's good to keep alive, in a sense, in a very real sense, the people that we've taken inside of us, right? So to sit and imagine people that are close to you that you won't be seeing on the deserted island or in solitary confinement, right? If, if you had a good experience, I'm making this up, with your sister growing up, like think a lot about her, call her to mind, evoke her, right? Evoke you when you were with her as a child, evoke you as you are now, right? Keep real yourself as a person and others. Keep it real in words you may say to yourself, in words that you may write. The same way a person keeps you know, track of time, we have to keep a structure, right? I remember reading at one point, uh, uh, Nelson Mandela describing right, what he had, you know, what was it like, you know, trying to survive and to try to keep some sense of the passage of time. And so we need a structure around the passage of time and the passage of days. We also need a structure inside about who am I and what's the constellation of the world in which I live in. And, and when I read things like that, I'm also aware that the person is describing a rich inner life. Right, and, and, and they may not be describing like, I, I really cultivated my rich inner life because that's how I didn't lose myself, but the person that automatically is, is doing that, right? And that's how they're keeping life inside of them when ostensibly life has been taken away from them. I mean, again, not their physical life, but, but life as we, as we live it amongst other people. You brought up Nelson Mandela. Uh, I want to tie him to Viktor Frankl and the wife of um, Tom Hanks's character in Castaway. So you talked about calling forth people. So there's two things at play. There's other people in human connection. And that has been, I think, the biggest theme that we've talked about today is mm -hmm. the absolute crushing need for that. But there's also meaning and purpose. The two most impactful books probably that I've ever read are Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor mm -hmm. Frankl and Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. uh, both of whom I don't know that I am uh, impressive enough to do what they did. Like I, I stand in awe of mm -hmm. what they survived mm -hmm. in a way that scares yes. me for my own weakness. And I don't know if I could pull it off. I want to believe. How does one put meaning to their life? How does one put meaning to their suffering? And how does meaning play with trauma? And is that part of this grand retextualization? Mm -hmm. Well, trauma can rob us of meaning and we need Why? meaning to survive. Why does it rob us of meaning? Because if the trauma makes you think that you are cursed or that nothing will ever work or that you will only be continually hurt, I, I could list the litany of things I've heard over 20 years for the next several hours. That, that tells a person, you don't get to have meaning. You can't have meaning. Meaning's not for you, right? It, 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 crushing, you use the word crushing, that's the right word to put to it. We need meaning. And meaning is, is not described or contained in the way we often, in a classical sense, contextualize people. Right? The idea that there are drives in us that there is an aggressive or self-assertion drive, and there's a pleasure drive or a, a relief from suffering drive. So, so the thought that like, look, I want food and shelter and I wanna be able to reproduce and I, I want someone to be there to take care of me if I make it to be older and there are limited resources and I have to, I have to fight for that, right? That's what the idea that there are those two drives would tell us, but that doesn't explain at all Victor Frankl or what Victor Frankl wrote. It does not explain at all Nelson Mandela or what Nelson Mandela wrote. I don't know about Tom Cruise's character's wife in Castaway. I'm presuming she wasn't a volleyball. So I don't, that I'll have to learn more about. But, 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 but look, I, I presume it's just along the same line that like you, you have to make meaning and feel meaning. And, and trauma can 
take that away. And, and that's why resilience and perseverance, like these things are so important and we don't have an understanding or an answer to them. You know, there was a, a joke I heard at times in my training, which was uh, if you find the resilience gene, go right to Stockholm, right? Uh, but there isn't, of course, go right uh -oh, to, to Stockholm, collect go your collect Nobel the Nobel Prize. Prize got right? it, got it. But, but the joke was like, there's not a resilience gene, right? Like it, it's a complex constellation of, of genetic factors and mm. nurture factors and early childhood experience is so important. And, you know, neurochemical factors are important. Like there's so much there, right? But that's like the magic of humans who survive and thrive amidst adversity, right? It's resilience. And we can help to engender resilience in people. Could people find resilience through meaning, right? And I think that's the message of those books, right? And of the, the great thinkers, right? Is we, we have to have meaning in order to persevere, to be resilient. Like, you know, every morning, people in the concentration camp had to get up, right? They had to wake up and realize they were there. I mean, th there has to be an attachment to meaning Unreal. beyond the self. That could be other people, or it could be God, or it's just something greater than self. But we can help people have that meaning. Do we do nearly enough to help people have that meaning? No. We sent my patient home from the hospital with Cotard syndrome alone, with no plan for anything other than to be alone. So, mm -hmm. you no, know, we're not helping people in the way that we need to. So that trauma, it can be other things too, but in my very strong opinion, by and large, trauma drives people to places of feeling no meaning and therefore no worth and, and often therefore no drive to continue. So how do you help people ascribe meaning to trauma is probably the most important thing something very bad has happened to them and they have to put it in its place. How do you do it? How do you put meaning to something? Well, first we have to look at the truth of it, right? And, and the truth very often is that just something really bad has happened, right? That, that abuse and denigration coming through the lens of prejudice is real, right? The death of that person is real. The injury is real. And we need to honor that. Now, can there be a silver lining so to speak, of, of negative things? Yes, there can be. And that's not a Pollyanna statement to make. And when people make it in a Pollyanna way, we'll, we'll turn this good. There's, there's nothing to get someone who, who suffered bad trauma to recoil from you more than saying that. Like, we have to acknowledge that it's bad, right? There's nothing good about having been abused or denigrated. Like, there's nothing good about this, right? It's bad, but we can see it for what it is and for what it means and what it doesn't mean. Someone really hurt you, there's shame there but the shame is on the person who hurt you, not you, right? Let's see it for, for what it really is. And then we can move forward and we can make something good, right? Has good come of my brother's suicide? I think it has. It's a huge part of why I went to medical school. And I like to think I've helped a few people along the way and that it's made me, it's allowed me to maybe be a more compassionate person than I might otherwise be, all of my other flaws and faults aside, right? That like, it's done something for me and allowed me to do something for others. That doesn't mean I think my brother's suicide was a good thing. And I have to be able to see that and understand that. And then I have to be able to see it for what it is and what it isn't. Do you knowingly say, I'm ascribing this meaning to that as a way to um, give it meaning, feel better? Like I, for me to, really acknowledge the mental jujitsu helps. I don't want to be oblivious to it. I right. want to say, oh, okay, this really horrendous thing has happened. I want to be hyper aware of my response. I want to be hyper aware right. of the tools that I need to deploy. I need to find meaning to this. I need to ascribe meaning to this. Um, do you do that? Do you mean with myself or with others? Yeah, with your or? brother's suicide, just to be really point blank. Sure, you were saying, sure. I like to think, yes. but I'm saying, do you do you spend time attaching that to that and saying, I went to medical school partly because of my brother. I have helped people uh, in his name. I don't know if that's how you think of it, but. Yes, yes, I, I do think that, right? I do think, okay, what were the sequelae of that event? Right. Sequelae? I don't uh, know. That word. What came after it? Like, okay, so the event happens. Was it consequences is all negative, right? So, what, so it's what were the downstream effects of it? What happened after it, right? And there were things that happened that, in the clarity of hindsight, I can see were just very bad, right? And they led bad places. Then there are things that I can see led good places. Like, for example, it gave me some freedom to go do something I wanted to do. So I did want to help people, 
But I also, all of a sudden, felt very naked in terms of knowledge of the human condition. And I thought I went to college and I'd been out and about in the world and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I don't understand anything. I felt so afraid and vulnerable. So part of my drive was to learn and experience and make myself safer. Part of my drive was to be helpful to others. But I put so much pressure on myself that I would never have gone back to school and thought, hey, you're gonna, you know, people were telling me when I left my job, like, whoa, like you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna have a real income for 10 years. And like people are saying things that scared me, right? And that, that would have scared me too much before. But it gave me permissiveness of like, look, I'm alive and I'm and I'm healthy enough to go do this. Why would I not try doing it, right? It emboldened me in a way. Maybe some of that was through desperation, a desire to make meaning. At the time, I didn't fully understand it. I knew some of those things. But in retrospect, you know, hindsight can be a lot closer to 2020 if we think and explore ourselves, which I haven't done this all on my own. I mean, I've had wonderful therapy. I'll, I'll thank Gregory Hamilton, who's been my therapist now for 12 years, for helping engender insight in me and, and help me to be able to do this and say, hey, there's a life narrative in me in which meaning has been made and goodness has been made of something that I see as bad and negative. Okay, so we can obviously find a path to reconnecting to other people when something has happened in the past. We can find a way to ascribe meaning to something that happened in the past. How do you help somebody who is under tremendous pressure right now? It's, it's an ongoing trauma and I think it's useful to focus on an ongoing trauma that one chooses. So this is born of Lady Gaga and um, her break. And I'm very curious, when you look at that, are you like, you need to retire, like this is too much? Or are you going, here's how we become either more resilient or more courageous or whatever. I'm assuming it's it's more mental jujitsu, it's, it's a reframe. But what does that look like as somebody and I'm asking, I'm not asking for a friend, I'm asking for myself. As somebody that like really wants to push the envelope of what is possible, what I will routinely run up against are my own limitations. So I'm always trying to push mm -hmm. my limitations a little bit further out, become more resilient, be able to handle more. One, do you just advise people like that, stop, you're just going for too much, or are there tactics that one can deploy to think about it anew to right. be able to go farther. Right. We, hopefully what, what I can engage someone in is a premise we can both agree on, right? So look, if your life is overwhelming, like things aren't gonna be okay, right? It's a pretty straightforward premise. Um, if you're overwhelmed, like you're not gonna navigate forward in a way that gets you what you want. So if we can agree about that, and sometimes it takes a little time, right? But if we can agree about that, then we can look at, okay, how and why is your life overwhelming? Right? Like maybe what you're doing, you could actually do quite well and quite readily if you took better care of yourself in other ways. Right? If you, you know, exercise, diet, you know, d d uh, different choices about life structure. So maybe we need to look at that, that what you're feeling overwhelmed by doesn't have to be overwhelming for you, but are you taking care of yourself, right? Maybe you are taking really good care of yourself in the sense of feeding and watering and sleeping and all of those things of self, right? But look, it's just unreasonable. Right, what you're trying, what you're foisting on yourself. I mean, given I'm very, very fortunate that I get to see so many people who are very high achieving, they have very high distress tolerance. Now, it's wonderful to have high distress tolerance in many, many, many ways, but that's also the person who can take on way, 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 way too much, right? And like, look, I don't care how capable a person is, there aren't 30 hours in your day. Right? There aren't, you know, there aren't even 25 in your day, right? So sometimes there has to be like, why is it that you would be asking more of yourself than is, of yourself than is possible, right? And we're not talking about like, can you stretch yourself and be at your best, right? We're talking about things that just make no sense. Like, you know, nobody can do that, right? And that's why, oh, people who try and do that, the, the outcome isn't good. You know, we, we, we see that. So we have to be rash. We have to look at it because you know, logic is also very important, right? We have to understand like, what are you actually doing? Or like, why are you overwhelmed? We have to understand that. 
Growing a business is hard, and if you're in the thick of it, you know that as your business grows, new challenges will be coming at you from every conceivable angle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve your margins. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free netsuite.com slash theory we learned earlier in the interview here that the logic doesn't matter me anybody else is driven by emotion primarily so right. in fact do you think of um somebody who is hyper driven do you just assume that they're pushing back against a trauma like it, often not always, but but think about here is again is how logic is subservient to emotion, right? If you come in and tell me I'm overwhelmed and I just can't take it anymore, right? Okay, you're telling me something, right? I want to understand it better, right? Then let's say we're talking and you're going to tell me things I can understand through logic. Well, how many hours do you sleep? I ask you that. Okay, are you how are you eating? Are you exercising? Who's in your life? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you drinking too much? Like I start learning about it, right? And you're going to tell me we're going to exchange information based upon logic, and here's what often happens. The person uses logic in a wonderful way that, that conveys all the details and tells us a story, but all of that is wrapped up, right, and, and has like the blanket of, of where emotion, right, affect, that limbic stuff drives a person, right? So you may very, very, very logically tell me why you have to have 30 very, very busy hours in your day or you're not good enough. Right? I'm like, okay, I, I mean, we have to understand the logic to understand how we're going to come at that, mm. but the premise is driven by something that's emotional. Otherwise, the logic would say, hey, I should stop that, right? I mean, I'm a very capable person and I'm very driven, but there's like, there's only so far, right? You know, by the way, the last three times I did this, you know, twice I ended up in the hospital, like, you know, wh why would logic not say to behave differently? It's because logic matters in the details of all of it. We need to know that, but logic doesn't matter in the drive. So then I become curious and I wish for you to be curious about why is it that you have to be more than human? Right? Like, why is it that what you as a very capable person, say in this example, or what, why is it that what you can do in 24 hours if you're really taking good care of yourself isn't enough? Or why is it that you think you can be extremely productive and still feel okay when you're not taking care of yourself? You know, so then we, we, it's the emotion, right, that, that the emotional part that's driving everything, but we need to understand the logic within that in order to say, okay, like, we have to have communication and back and forth of us of information and decide how we're going to come at it. Interesting. Okay, so um, I may not be the best example on this because so in fact, I'll give you my breakdown of what I do. I have a, a stance around overwhelm that I teach my students all the time, which is I don't do overwhelm. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is not that I have infinitely strong shoulders, though I, I am constantly trying to push how much weight I can carry comfortably, but I'm very pragmatic about one's biological needs. So my thing is, I'm never going to do things that cause me to lose sleep. If I'm losing sleep, then I know immediately that I have to change something. So what I tell myself is doing less is always an option. So if I'm starting to feel that rev up where I can feel my mind, it's it's starting, I, I don't even like saying overwhelm, because uh, I have such an identity mm -hmm. of I don't do overwhelm. Mm -hmm. But when I can feel that state that leads most people to becoming overwhelmed, uh, I do what I call downshifting. So I force my mind to slow down. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, oh, what more can I do? What more can I take on? I think, how do I relax? How do I slow down? What do I eliminate? Um, because doing less is always an option. And so I'm very careful not to build my self-esteem around being able to do more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's a very dangerous game. But what what I'm really fascinated by is, so you have a high performer like Lady Gaga, but the thing that freaks me out about her life that I recognize in myself would be a danger mm -hmm. is the bigger stage you play on, mm -hmm. the more sense of like, hey, these people, maybe they got a babysitter, they came out, they spent a ton of money to be at this concert, and now I need to perform. And to, um, there are all these promoters and managers and everything. They're all counting on me to do more show dates. And so, and also, I'm. I just know that not one singer ahead of me ever 
has lasted forever, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody goes away. Kids today don't even know who Michael Jackson is. So it's mm -hmm. like, right? So no matter how big you are, just poof, gone. So there's a sense of making hay while the sun shines. And so there's all these sort of innate pressures. And to me, to play the game well, it it isn't just to do less. It is also to figure out how you can do more without distressing yourself. So you want to push your tolerance. You want to make sure that you don't value yourself for the amount that you can do. And you uh, also want to know that doing less is always an option. So it's it, it's this really interesting thing. Mm -hmm. But when I look at other people that have achieved way more than I've achieved, I'm just like, whoa, like they they have either burn themselves out in a way that I'm not willing to, or they have figured out how to press that um, their breaking point farther away. And so mm -hmm. when I hear a story like Lady Gaga's, I secretly, I'm over here like, I want you to tell me that you have some secret formula where she can just reframe, hey, you can't worry about what other people think or whatever, hopefully not that trite. And now right. you can like play on the biggest stage ever. That's right. secretly what right. I want to hear. Yeah, and, and here again, I know I keep saying this, but it's just so important. It's all personalized. Like, who is that person? So just one example, you said, like, sleep is inviolable for you, right? Like, you can't change the sleep, right? So you know yourself well enough to know that, right? For me, I can change the sleep, but there are other things I can't change, right? So it's like, know thyself, right? Because that's how we know how to take care of ourselves and understand ourselves. So then beyond those kind of maybe more basic or mechanical parameters, right? We then look, the interesting part are the intangibles about the person, right? So, so for example, very high distress tolerance, high levels of conscientiousness, and high levels of empathy or empathic attunement is wonderful, right? But boy, doesn't that create a liability, right? Like there's another side of everything, right? Every good thing can be too much of that good thing can be harmful to that person. So that's the person who's going to see like, there's more for me to do. People want more of me. There's more good to do, right? And, and because there's a high level of distress tolerance, that person can overextend themselves way more than the vast majority of people can. And they're in a setting often that facilitates that, that says, right, right, more is better. That's thinking more about that than the person. Then the person's conscientious, right? Wants everything to be great, right? And they're empathic. They understand how people feel and how they make them feel. And then that is a recipe for the person being so well-meaning and wanting to take care of themselves, which is pushing themselves farther than they can be pushed. And that's where the lesson often that I, I find that I'm bringing to people who have high distress tolerance or conscientious or empathic and are in the public eye in a way that they can do a lot of good, you know, and they can do a lot of good through their presence in the world. Just one example, right? They tend to get themselves overwhelmed because they're trying to do more than a human can do, right? And, and then what we're talking about is like human standards do apply. Like you know, this is a very, very capable human, but like you have to allow yourself humanness, right? <laughs> so now we're coming at that, right? Is it true? I mean, sometimes we, I'm saying, is it true that you have to be more than human to be okay, right? And I, at times, will be saying that to someone. Now, that might be someone who has wealth and fame and wants to do certain things that, to, to make the world better. It may also be the person who is quietly toiling away, you know, taking care of five kids and has a job and a home to take care of and, you know, and feeling bad about themselves because they can't shoulder it all because no human can. Right, so, so the limits of humanness and recognizing works against shame, right? Because if you think you're supposed to be more than human, you end up failing, right? And feeling ashamed of yourself, feeling, feeling like you failed. So the person has to know themselves enough so that they know what works for them and what doesn't. You need sleep, but maybe the thing that I need, you don't, right? So we gotta know ourselves and what works for us and what doesn't work for ourselves. And then we have to understand what are reasonable limits? Right? And do they change, right? I mean, I see people who say after having a pneumonia, real example, it takes people a while to recover, but they're furious with themselves that they can't do, you know, two weeks after the pneumonia, what they were able to do before. And, and the rest is like, whoa, like, you, you know, you need to be kind to yourself. You have to nurture yourself. Like you can do all that again, but just not now. Like you're not supposed to be superhuman. Like after humans like break a leg or get pneumonia, they it takes recovery time, right? But that's when we're getting at often, what is the trauma that tells that person that they have to be more than human, right? And you know, sometimes as people want so much of me and I'm so empathic and I've labored under, I need to do more for so long. Maybe it's that. Maybe that person was very vulnerable 
when they were younger and they learned the only way I'm going to take care of myself is to be superhuman. Maybe they learned that they weren't good enough unless everything was an A+. Plus, right? I mean, we don't know where it comes from. But if that's the lesson, there's something traumatic at the root of it. Yeah, for sure. So as one sort of last take on that, how do you balance grace for yourself, love for yourself, acceptance of your limitations, a willingness to be human with wanting to push yourself and really taking advantage of what I think is the greatest gift of the human experience, which is you can get better. Right, right. Well, it has to start from a premise. That says, look, I can, I can make my life better. You know, I think I can make my life good. And then let me try and understand myself because what you just described is hard to do. Right? So if a person doesn't have the ability to say, go out and get psychotherapy, right? then reflect, meditate, talk to people around you about life. You know, plenty of people talk a lot, but they're not talking about each other, right? You know, you talk about, hey, what's up with you? We haven't talked in a while about like what's going on in life, or you've looked a little different, you know, one way or another. Like, when people talk really about life, reflect about life, write about life, think about yourself, be curious about yourself, right? I'm never not going to therapy. I don't care what happens. My, if you say nothing could ever go wrong again, I know that's not going to be true, but I'll go to therapy because. It's hard to understand ourselves and it's hard to keep the plate spinning of life even when we are trying to be conscious of taking care of ourselves. So, so if one has whatever abilities or resources we have to understand ourselves and to be curious about ourselves and others and people we love around us, take advantage of it. Because what you just described, like that's when people are living healthily, right? That's when people can roll with the punches pretty well when things go negative, you know, in a negative way. And, and they can feel good about the things that go positive and they can make rational attributions. Like, hey, that thing went well and it's not just luck. Like people will say, everything bad is my fault. Everything good is luck, right? I mean, how many times do we hear that? Of take responsibility if something didn't go well and you're a part of that, like, look at that. Right? The goal isn't to let people out of their responsibility, right? You know, if you're driving along carefully and somebody broadsides you, like, I, I can't map that to your responsibility. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, you weren't really paying that attention the way that you would really like to have been, like, just take ownership of that, right? It doesn't mean it's your fault, but it's like, I want to look at everything and I want to understand how I can bring myself to bear, to make my life better. And I want to do that when, when they're negative things. And I want to do that when there are positive things. I don't want to discount the positive as luck or nobody loves me or nobody cares about me. Nobody likes me. Oh, I was out from work for three weeks and, you know, 14 people sent flowers, you know, or, or like really care to call, you know, don't, don't make yourself special in a negative way. Right. It's something I often, you know, find myself wow, saying. That's interesting. So that, so it's about understanding because what you described is hard but it is not impossible. And it's not impossible even when there's a strong current for a person to swim against. And that current isn't necessarily, isn't determined by socioeconomic status, right? Or, you know, or by some other demographic where, where, where people will think like, I'm not gonna be able to do that, right? It, it, it can be as hard whether people have resources or don't, or like, you know, there's, there, there's no arbiter of how hard that is, right? Other than if people are really struggling, obviously to put a roof over their head and food, like we need to help as a society people more, but to not be deterred because I've never had therapy before, or, you know, I, I can write an introspect, but I, I don't have insurance to go get, get someone to help me, or I can buy one book, but not five. It's like, just start doing something because that factor of, does it register in you? I can understand myself better. I can make my life better, right? Maybe I'm not responsible for the bad things that are running over and over in my head. That factor is worth more than all the seemingly logistical things that money and resources can provide. So don't be deterred if you don't feel that you have what it takes, even if you don't have anyone to talk to. You, have a, you can have a pen and paper, right? Like th th there are things we can do to help ourselves and don't be deterred because that resolve that awareness, maybe life can be better, often matters more than any other factor. Yeah, I, I love that a lot. I think that that's an area that people um, fail to understand. And I, I think this is the biggest trap about trauma is it leads you to believe that you're not gonna be able to improve things. And mm -hmm. so uh, I always push back against too much self-acceptance. It's like, I do want people to love themselves, but I want them to earn that love. 
And the reason is, in fact, it's not that I want people to, it's that there is an algorithm running in your mind given to you by evolution that demands that you earn your own respect by doing things that you believe are valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, the things you believe are valuable are gonna be born of both evolution, mm -hmm. uh, again, with those algorithms, and things you've chosen to believe, but you can't stand in front of the mirror and just say, I love you, I love you, I love you, unless you can tie that to reasons. I love you because, and unfortunately, I think our I think everybody's love is conditional, even your mother's. And certainly your own love of yourself is highly conditional. And the sooner that people embrace that and realize one of the great joys of life is getting better, growing, pushing yourself and improving, mm -hmm. uh, you just have to be very careful about what you build your self-esteem around. In fact, speaking of that, do you talk to people about what they build their self-esteem around. This feels yes. like a really important yes. thing. What do you encourage them to build their self-esteem yes. on? Relevant to that question and everything that you just said about wanting to look in the mirror and be able to love yourself and respect yourself and feel good about yourself is look, we always want to know what we don't know, right? If we don't know what we don't know, we will fall victim to it. So understanding that we can't know everything about ourselves, that the process of understanding ourselves isn't just taking stock of what I know now, but it's curiosity about ourselves. It's the kind of things that come out to us through meditation or reflection or conversation. It is so important to know that we can't just look in the mirror and know everything about ourselves. Like a, a great majority of what goes on inside of ourselves is hidden from us. It doesn't mean that our conceptions of self can't be both good and conscious, mm -hmm. but we need to be respectful of, of the things that we don't understand. And even that, there are things that we don't understand. Because it is, uh, it is very often that from which we start building the, the strong sense of self, right? Because we, we have to start off from a place that is real, right? It's why I think I had said to you when we were talking before that like my math minor, as I, I often say, is I think, you know, the most helpful uh, academic or intellectual thing I've ever done, right? It taught me to look at things in a logical, linear manner, right? Because logic is important. Like the times it doesn't get trumped by emotion, we're using it for understanding, right? So we want to be able to bring logic to bear to try and understand ourselves. But part of that process tells us that we want to bring logic to bear in understanding our own lives, that we can construct narratives, that we can go look at ourselves and say, okay, wait, what happened when? Like we can use logic to accept that that thing we were kind of pushing under the surface maybe actually was really traumatic. And, and I can think about the changes in me before and after. So we use logic to construct a story of self, right? And the story of self is very interested in us, right? It's interested in ourselves. And it's interested in the things that have gone on or are going on underneath the surface. Because that tells us about the things that are more powerful than logic. I might be able to logically describe to you all sorts of things about myself at a certain stage of life and all sorts of different things at another stage in life, right? And maybe the things became negative in the, in the context of trauma, but I need to understand that, oh, something happened that shifted what is true inside of me, right? In a mathematical way, if you can't understand it, go back to the givens. Right? So if it's a given inside of me that I've been the same all along and nothing has really changed in me in some way that I don't understand, I'm totally not gonna understand how I have changed in my conception of self, right? If, if I can perceive that, hey, trauma can change people and I can see that I'm different outside of the trauma, then we go back to the givens of the problem and we see that something has happened and the whole lay of the land is different. Right? That's why I wrote in the book that I wrote about a map that has changed, that maybe you had a map helping you understand yourself and what you're capable of and what you're good at and what you enjoy and what you know you might steer away from because you don't enjoy it as much or aren't as good. Like you understood all of this and you understood that you were a good person and a perseverant person. If you cease to understand that, the whole map of self has changed. Mm. So we may need to go back to that. And that's what I'll often end up saying is because people sometimes will want to start off from the givens, the premise that nothing's ever going to be okay. Maybe I could eat something out, but I'm cursed. And we have to go say, well, we have to go back to the givens of this problem, right? Of, of like, did your map change because of trauma? And again, we can use a mathematical analogy or we can use a, the analogy of a map. But what we're trying to get at is constructing a story of self that honors logic and uses logic to investigate, but most importantly, honors the impact of the limbic, of the emotional, 
right? And if we're going to honor the impact of the limbic and the emotional, we will not be able to do that without honoring the impact of trauma in very, very, very many people. Mm. Yeah, that, uh, that is a complex bag of things. Speaking mm -hmm. of complex bags, my favorite story in the book is Uncle Rango, oh. uh, which, man, it's weird to say that that's uh, a favorite, but mm -hmm. I was actually really inspired by that story. Yes. Um, if you don't mind, who is Uncle Rango mm -hmm. and how did he make it into the book? Mm -hmm. well, I so appreciate that you said that. It's, it's my favorite story of my life. Right, in terms of um, learning from it, right? I may have stories at the birth of my children that are more emotional, but when I think of life lessons, it's the best story mm -hmm. because very little was expected of him. And he was expelled from school in the sixth grade. No one paid much attention to him. He was angry. He fought a lot, right? There were a lot of things about him that from the outside, would have looked very unimpressive, like someone who didn't have much inside of him. And I don't know how he felt about himself back then. He didn't have a lot of words to put around those things, right? But what I do know is he lived a great life and he was a good person in the community around him. He was good to his family. He was solid at the things that he did. And when he talked about himself, there was such a dramatic change after he went off to service in the Second World War. Because what was inside of him came to the fore and he was promoted in the field uh, several times over to become a master sergeant and was decorated twice for bravery in battle. And the one that he was proud of, that he talked about to me and I think to my mother and certainly to his wife, but it may have been to no one else, uh, was that he jumped out of a foxhole under heavy fire to rescue someone who had been shot and was sort of left there to suffer because maybe people would try and rescue that person and get killed themselves. And mm -hmm. without anyone else, he jumped out, he, he put the person, you know, bolts flying and he made it back, right? And I think what he understood from his experiences was that he could lead people. When, when push came to shove, uh, he could call upon in himself uh, qualities, perseverance, resilience, that as far as I could understand, no one thought were in him and he didn't think was in him either. At one point in time when he was leading a group of men behind enemy lines, they radioed in and thanked them for their service, right? Many, the, the expectation was that they were all going to die. And he led all of them to safety. Jesus. Right? Now that was the first time he was decorated. And I think this honors the complexity of trauma because I think what my uncle experienced in the, in the Second World War made him a person who had a good life, right? I should say, he made himself a person who had a good life, but that experience was germane to it. But the Second World War was an awful thing, and it was an awful thing for him too. And the reason he never told people about the decorations, we knew he was decorated, it was, it'd been in the papers, but he wouldn't talk about it, including the one where there's no shame, right? You jumped out of a foxhole with bullets flying, you put someone over your shoulder and you carried them back and saved their life, right? What is there to be ashamed about? Nothing about that, but he was ashamed of himself because in order to lead those men from behind enemy lines, someone had to kill the prisoners they had. And his thought was put into a position of leadership where now he was leading was you can't ask somebody to do that. You can't order someone to do that. I don't know how the command structure works. Really. If that has to be done, it's your responsibility if you're in charge to do it. And it tortured him the rest of his life. So, so much good came in what he learned about himself, but the suffering came along with it. And I think it honors the complexity of human beings and of trauma. And ultimately, I think it is a story of triumph that he did survive. And people sent him letters many, many years on. There were people who sent him a letter. It was another grandchild. And they'd send him a letter, like, here's another person who was born because of what you did for us. Mm. I mean, I saw some of those letters, right? But he carried within him the shame that he understood that he was capable of killing someone who wasn't armed, regardless of what the situation was. And he understood that he did the right thing. I mean, he was very concrete in that way. It was the right thing to do. But it doesn't mean it's not supposed to torment you. 
Yeah, for people that don't know the details of the story, which you cover in the book, they had to cross back over uh, from enemy lines at night silently, and they had three prisoners of war uh, who obviously would have been incentivized to make noise. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he killed them. That That is, uh, man, to your point, that's just, that's brutal. And goes back to that need to contextualize what it means. And I have to imagine in terms of assigning meaning that it would be incredibly meaningful to see the people that came into the world that otherwise right. would not have had he not brought them back. Did he ever talk about that? Very little. What was clear to me, I never asked him this because I didn't ask him things, you know, at times he said things. And as he got older, he said a little bit more, but I was very careful, as was my mother, about what we asked him. But it was very clear that he would never have done that to save his own life, mm. that he could not have done that. It would have been shameful to do so, to save. As he said, there were three boys just like me. That's what he said. There were three boys and I was one boy. They spoke a different language and I do it. No matter, four boys, right? But he was responsible for all those other men. And I think that's why it meant so much to him because that was the meaning of it all. And all those letters were saved and my, my aunt, his wife died after him and the letters were burned and their ashes were buried with her. That's how important it all was to him and to her. It was my understanding that she, um, she was the one that called for them to be destroyed because she said they're his and nobody else's or something. What, I don't know why that hit me, but it hit me. What, what was her logic? Why, why not? Um, you know, you look at somebody like Churchill, I'm reading a right. biography of Churchill right now, which by the way is astounding. <sighs> His life is absolutely incredible. Yes. Um, but he wanted the world to read the letters. People used to say, sometimes you felt like you got a letter from him because he was right. like pre-printing it. Right. Um, why destroy them? I would kill to read those. Yeah. I believe it's because they were so personal, right? That there was a personal justification for what he did that was embodied in those letters. In the next child or as life went on, grandchild, great-grandchild, that, that I believe reminded him of the meaning of it. Like that, that's what I thought about it at the time and, and I've thought that ever since. And, and, and he and my aunt had agreed to that, that mm -hmm. they were so personal that if he died, whoever has died last would be buried with the ashes of the letters. And then whenever she died, she would be buried with his dog tags. And that's Whoa, what they did. Man, yeah. their relationship sounds uh, very interesting. And I would, going back to connecting to another human is yeah. the thing that's going to get you past trauma. Right. I'd love to hear more about their relationship. Anything that you know about, like, was that a gravitational center for them? You know, going to war, my uncle was in Vietnam and my aunt uh, mm -hmm. has been pretty clear when he came back, It it that mm -hmm. was sort of the beginning of the end. Um, and just, he was never able to contextualize the trauma. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, it did not lead to ideal relationship behavior. So right. what was it that allowed uncle rango and his wife to connect like was it a knowing thing were they good at this because it sounds like before he went to war he's fighting a lot he's getting in trouble nobody expects much it's kind of surprising that he ends up having this um yeah. love affair for his entire life to the point where she's being buried with his dog tags and i mean it's just right. like it's pretty right. intense yeah so to the best of my understanding you know, my uncle rango had a lot of charisma right there was a lot about him that drew people as well he was a good leader and my Aunt Rose was quite a catch, right? I see that from the pictures and how everyone talked about her. And they had a romance before he went off to war. And they had something that people, unfortunately, often did not have in the Vietnam era, which is like the knowledge that people at home you know, were pulling for them and thought they were mm, doing, understood they were doing this, right, that they were doing something important. And, and he was, was conscious of that, that he was going off to fight for, they were very proud, they were Italian immigrants, they were very proud to be American, and he was going off to fight for America, and her man was going off to fight for America. They were very traditional in their roles, mm -hmm. and you know, part of his motivation, which you talk about, is he wanted to come home to her, 
and she wanted him to come home to her and that was with them I, I think in letters I never knew that they write letters to one another I never learned that I they must have right I just didn't know them and then when he came back he was received in that way he was a hero in the community I mean the the, the you know there the were communities were very ethnically and in many ways still are ethnically divided uh, the Italian American community and a lot of the people in certain generations of immigrants and he was a hero in that community you know he had gone off and fought for America and he'd honored himself so he he had that and she was very respectful in that way that like she just loved and admired and was in awe of him for what he had gone and done and he loved and admired her for you know the steadfastness of the person that she was and I don't know that my uncle Iango ever washed the dish and my aunt Rose didn't go out and lay tile but you know they had very traditional roles um, those roles were so mutually supportive and and it's not just specific to that era but it it works so well for them uh, and I think under you know the roles then couched the real closeness and intimacy that existed between them and I think he was able to share with her in a way that he wasn't with anyone else, because he was very you know, ashamed to talk about feelings, right? And I think he could talk about them with my Aunt Rose. I believe that to be true. Hmm. It's really interesting. You mentioned um, the narrative and the breakdown of shared narratives really worries me in a modern context. I, there's no other time I would rather be alive. I am not pessimistic about the world in general, but I also want to face head on the things that are difficult. And I think that one of the things that's very difficult is the velocity of information made available by social media, the sort of algorithmically induced psychosis of only seeing one thing over and over mm -hmm. and over and over and over and over, and over whether that's um, the things you already believe or the things that make you irate, because that's what social media does to make sure that the engagement is up, uh, is really uh, upset people. Breakdown of shared narratives. So if what we've been talking about today mm -hmm. is on the money and how you contextualize your trauma, your role, the meaning that you assign things, how much do you deal in your clinical practice with people that they, they're just not able to put together a cohesive narrative about who they are, what they bring to the world? And do you think about that breakdown at a, a societal level as well? Like, does that make your radar as something to be concerned about? Yeah, you know, often it is hard to help a person establish a narrative. I mean, I think once we get rolling, it goes pretty well, but sometimes getting it moving is hard because there is that resistance, right? And that is often because the person doesn't see the social context, right? So, so think about someone who internalizes that they are less than because of a prejudice that they grew up with. And they grew up with it so intensely, and it was like the only thing present in a sense. The soup they were swimming in, so to speak, right, was was that. And then the shame of it tells them where logically they can say, I mean, how many times does this happen? I could never count. Where they could say, someone else, I would never tell anyone they're less than because of, and they'll say the thing they were bullied or where the, the lens through which the prejudice came, right? But they feel that they are different, right? But But me, I am ashamed, I am less than, right? Because that's the lesson of trauma. People will say that all the time. They, they would not denigrate or tell someone, oh, you're hopeless or this or that because of the exact same thing that has happened to them, right? But we reflexively make ourselves special for negative reasons. And then we lose sight of that. We lose sight of truth, right? So we have to come at that, right? So, so one way of coming at that is it used to be done and sometimes it's like an empty chair way. Well, please, Tell that person who's been through exactly what you have. I mean, what's the, the, the tactic's not that subtle, right? Like we're trying to get the person talking essentially to themselves, right? And tell them that what they did is wrong and they should feel ashamed and it was their fault, right? And the person can't do it, right? Because they're thinking outwardly and they wouldn't say it to someone else. Do we have our route in? You know, or what do they say? So that may be a route in. In another setting with a different person, it may be to talk about the social context. Gosh, that's shameful in some places and not in others. You know, shameful in places that have a societal sickness and not in places that don't, right? So, so look, we, we, can, we can guide towards exposing the unconscious, which, which really often, what does it mean? Often exposing the lessons of trauma that are in us in these ways we're not aware of. The less than lessons, the shame lessons, the oh, I'm limited lessons, I'm cursed lessons, for you but not for me lessons. So there are a lot of ways of getting at that. And sometimes there's resistance and sometimes there, 
isn't. You know, and again, it's, it's hard to tell and you don't really tell by intelligence. You, you tell by, can the person make a connection? Are they curious about themselves? And if not, then if I'm the therapist, it's my job to work hard for that of, I want to make a connection, right? I want to work hard on it. I want to figure out the route of approach because we all have narratives, right? We all have narratives. And if there's no real trauma impacting the narrative, great. The narrative is still relevant, right? Maybe that person who has recurrent depression that doesn't have anything to do with trauma does have to do with other purely physical conditions in their life or medical conditions, right? Like it's always important to know the narrative. How? And the narrative most often leads us to the impact of trauma. Hmm. The narrative leads to the impact of trauma, meaning, help me understand that. What do you mean by that? Okay, so I'll give an example I often give is, so this is a true story. So a young woman who had won an award in high school, okay, and she didn't grow up in privileged circumstances or where a lot was expected of her, but she was very smart, very empathic. Like you li list all the qualities to like go out there and conquer the world. Like she had them all but not a lot was expected of her and it wasn't an environment where people were gonna challenge, celebrate anything right, like that. But there were opportunities here and there and she'd won an award right back in high school and it was a big award to win and it was the anchor in her to, look, I can do more, right? Like there's something in me, right? Like I, I can go do this or I can go do that. I can leave this place that hasn't done well by me and I, I can make a life for myself. Like she believed that, why? Because it was true. Right, And it was anchored to something, as often we anchor things that are important to something tangible, like I won that award, this is what that tells me. Okay, on the other side of a very bad trauma, she had an understanding of exactly what that award meant. That was the understanding she'd always had of it, to ask her in the, in the present, right? And it was that the award was a mockery of her. That it, that it showed that that was the best thing that would ever happen to her, that like that was gonna be her crowning. You know, she was all sorts of sarcastic and cynical things about herself and what it meant was that she couldn't go anywhere. The exact opposite, with no awareness whatsoever that that had changed in her. Hmm. She's so not an outlier. What I hear you saying then is nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So, cause you said the mm -hmm. narrative leads to the trauma so if yeah. she, which I love, this speaks my language in terms of how I would hold myself accountable if something happened to me. So getting back to our initial question, uh, if, if I encountered a major trauma, and look, I, I have had my share of traumas, but I've always, I, I haven't one that I would sort of put as category one, uh, death, um, being attacked or something like that, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But if I did, the thing that I would be trying to figure out is how do I tell a story about that that empowers me and allows me to move forward? And so what I hear you saying is that if the narrative is the thing that leads to the trauma, this, look, the thing is obviously bad. Your brother dying is obviously bad. Right. So I am not asking anybody to believe that the trauma itself is good. But going back to Viktor Frankl, going back to Nelson Mandela, it's like being locked up for as long as Nelson Mandela was, being in a concentration camp full stop, just horrendous, horrendous. But both of them found a way to find meaning so that they could get through it and not only get through it, once out, like really thrived and, and echoed through the world mm -hmm. in pretty amazing ways. So if what you're saying is true, the narrative can lead to the trauma, then the narrative should also be able to lead away from the trauma into making sense of something in a way that allows you to move forward in a positive way. Yes, is I think the way I might summarize that and I'll, I'll explain is to say, nothing that is not bad is automatically either good or bad, right? Like there are bad things, like being imprisoned unjustifiably. That's a bad thing, right? A death that's unexpected, and happen suddenly is a, is a bad thing. Doing things to hurt people is a bad thing. It's a bad thing we can do. I have done that and it has been bad, right? That kind of statement of I recognize in myself that I've done bad things. That's, that's sometimes the bad thing to recognize, right? But after parsing that apart, like directly harming people, right, is bad, whether it's physical, it's emotional. Like I, I, I'm very comfortable making a direct statement about that. Hurting people is bad. Right? And there are ways we can do that. And there are ways we can't do that. If I have some slight value difference from you and I think, oh, that's bad because you're hurting my family values or whatever, that's not true, right? Like there are things that are, that are subject to opinion and there are things that are just very clearly bad and directly hurting someone is bad. 
And if you've done that, then we can take stock of it, we can atone, we can take stock of why did we do that? Can we seize upon the good in ourselves, make things better? Like the man in the other story who had done very, 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 very many bad things and was automatically doing bad things in a, in a reflexive way, who found it in himself to recognize all of that and thereby do something good, right? So we, we parse out there is good and bad, right? But after we get over that is what is our perception of it and trauma I'm simplifying a little bit, but trauma drives towards the bad, right? That means this thing is bad and you are bad. It's not this thing is bad and maybe you are not bad, right? But we have to understand that so that we can understand what it means. This bad thing has happened, but I am not bad. I lost my brother to suicide. That doesn't mean that I'm cursed. It doesn't mean that I'm a loser and I'm never gonna make anything of myself. It doesn't make any sense, right? Something bad happened, but I'm not bad. I'm not perfect either, and I want to look at ways to make myself better, but I'm separating the truth from the reflex, which is something bad has happened and I am bad. When I was around him and, and I didn't know, I didn't see, I mean, you know, that's the path we go down. Of, and I can, you know, I could, you know, I could count, or could not, could not count how many times a person, including at times me, earlier in life, would explain why I am bad. In a way that seems logically very, very sound, except is untrue because all that logical soundness is, is couched in the emotion that tells me I must be bad, so now I'm gonna back map to the logic. Just like the person who doesn't make memories going forward says, I don't wanna shake your hand, right? I don't know why, and then makes up a story, right? But the importance of the story is, is the badness, right? In that case, it's the badness because last time I shook your hand, it was a pain like, I hurt, it hurt, so that's bad, right? But it's much, much, much more important, right? When the, the story is us. I am bad and I'm gonna tell you why. Right? Mm-hmm. And there's no one who, who, who believes, who knows, so to speak, that they are bad, who doesn't tell you a story of why. We all do, right? So we need to understand that the, the premise isn't right. And if the premise is right, that there's bad in us and we've done bad things, I've worked with many people who've done things, we look at it, that is bad, let's call that for what it is. And let's look at it in a way, because as you commented earlier on in our discussion, we are responsible for ourselves going forward. Who else is gonna take responsibility for us? Mm-hmm. I think that also means that we're responsible for helping each other more than we do, right? That if one of us has no one and is alone, that that we contribute some resources to helping them have a cat. Or, you know, the the societal interventions that link people to people who need people linked to them, like the gregarious person to the nursing home, or gosh, you're down on your luck, let's help you so you can get back on your feet. Like, we don't help people a lot in society. We owe more to one another because of our human interconnectedness. But that doesn't mean anyone's taking responsibility for us and we we can't and should not count on that. We take responsibility for ourselves and lo and behold, that's also how we marshal the best supports around us. Mm. If I take responsibility for myself, I say, okay, now let me look at who or what can help me. If I don't take responsibility for myself and I feel like nothing can ever get better or I'm thinking some awful things and I got my head down, literally and metaphorically and I'm not gonna see the help that's around me. You might be standing next to me holding out a helping hand. I won't even see it. Those are individual narratives. What do you think about the shared narratives? So there's a couple things that I worry about. One, you've got social media allows you to algorithm your way to um, a narrow band of humanity and you never see anything outside of that. So you get a breakdown or an atomization is probably the right way to think about algorithms. You get an atomization of the algorithm. So you're having an experience that is relevant to you and all the things that you've cobbled together, but you don't necessarily have a broader spectrum of like a a wider sense of unity. So you talked about um, Uncle Rango was Italian, but he was a proud American. Mm -hmm. And that sense of the bigger narrative of proud American that yes. that is breaking down. And so we get into um, smaller tribes because you're eventually gonna be in a tribe, but the bigger the tribe, I think the better off you are, the more atomized the tribe, the more problematic. So that's part number one, that we're getting into these very atomized tribes. Part number two is the kinds of things that used to give us really broad tribes was religion. And once re- religions, and by the way, I'm not religious, um, But once religion stopped being a truth and started being a story, I think that's like that just furthers this atomization of uh, the tribal units. And when I think about, okay, the, the thesis that we've laid out today is you really need to connect. 
Like that, that's a big punchline. And the fact that a person can think themselves dead because they have stopped connecting with other people is just really, really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at what's happening in a modern context, do you see that feeding into um, trauma, depression, an inability to create a positive state? And if so, how can people inoculate themselves yeah. against that? Yeah, okay. I just wanna scream yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we are in a place societally where I believe we step further and further away from our responsibility as citizens. My uncle saw it as his responsibility as, a, as an American citizen to go to war for America, right? We often don't see it as my responsibility as an American citizen to think about what's coming my way. And then we falsely polarize. If group A and group B are opposed, and I'm in group A and you're in group B, right? Isn't it so much easier if some data comes my way, allegedly, right? Some assertion that says how bad group B people are. I'd be like, yeah, I don't like them anyway, right? You're bad and I'm not. And then data, information, alleged data comes to you that group A people are bad. Right, you're bad. I, I mean, we're distancing ourselves because we're not fulfilling our responsibility to stop and think. Confirmatory evidence is, is emotionally gratifying, right? If I think B people are bad and like a B person did something bad, I, I see it in the news and somebody pushed it to me, right, you're all bad, right? Like how many times are we doing that? How many thousands and thousands of times are we doing that? And then the political mechanisms, this is not my place I think to be political, but to say psychologically, right? Political mechanisms harness that, right? Now you have a bunch of people who are not assessing data one way or another who give in to the seduction of the confirmatory evidence. It feels good to see that, right? Instead of saying, well, wait, wait a, wait a second. A B person did that. Did an A person do the same thing? Like maybe none of this matters, right? Or is that really hurtful to me? Or is it just easy to say, yeah, and that feels good to me? Look, the same way, we have a responsibility of sometimes reaching for the apple and not the potato chips, right? It's a lot easier to reach for the potato chips, but if you keep doing that and you're not taking responsibility for yourself, right, you become very unhealthy, right? So we say, and we should say more, you have a responsibility for yourself, right? We don't talk about the responsibility as citizens to have some understanding of what we're, what is true and what we're saying and why, right? It doesn't mean we shouldn't have opinions that differ, but let's separate truth from opinions, right? I don't think it's politics to say that when you have, say, pictures side by side of like, this is crowd size A and this is crowd size B. And crowd size A is bigger than crowd size B. And we could survey first graders across the world and they'll agree with that. But yet we have an entire set of assertions and then further assertions and alleged facts based upon the patently untrue idea that the smaller crowd was bigger. Like, we're not going to be okay. Right? Like, we need to reject that because we start treading into truth doesn't matter because it serves me to think that truth doesn't matter or because it serves me to harness people who are susceptible so to that. we tr getting to what is true is very problematic and i definitely i share your concerns there but before we move on to truth how do we generate a shared narrative what what is the right um level of analysis right. for building out the narrative is it country? Is it neighborhood? Is it right, left? Is it global? Like, how do we, in a world where atomization is the gravitational pull, what do we use in a world where it doesn't seem like religion fits the bill anymore? Although maybe that's your answer and I'm certainly open. Mm -hmm. um, but what is the thing? What is the narrative? How do we use mm -hmm. that to bring us together? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's got to start, it's got to start close to home, right? The idea of take responsibility for a lot of things, enact and live that responsibility towards some of those things and don't feel responsible for everything, right? So the idea of take responsibility for a lot of things, right? So I take responsibility for what's directly around me. Right? I take responsibility if I walk outside the door here and someone has tripped and fallen, I'm going to stick a hand out to help them up. Right? If, if you look really sad and I'm a little worried, I'm going to say something. Right? I'm going to take responsibility for, the, for the, the people and the situations around me. If I'm intimidating someone and getting my way met or I know someone wants to say something to me and I turn my back through one way or another, it's, then it's my responsibility to stop 
doing that, to look around me and to take responsibility and then and then take that on higher levels too, right? The, the immediate, the street I live on is, is much more my responsibility, right, than, than the community I live in. But the community I live in is, is my responsibility too, right, as is the world, right? I can't solve global warming, but I could think a little bit more about my buying, you know, bottles that get re recycled to put in a landfill, or did I think to take something with me I can put water in? Like, so there's less responsibility because we can control less, right? But then some people can do very much on the world stage, right? But it has to start in a pyramidal way with responsibility for what's closest. So, so the first responsibility is between me and me. Am I selling myself short by telling myself lies? Am I selling myself short because it's easier to eat the potato chip than the apple and I really don't feel well? And you know, I can't exercise anymore and I see my energy going down and like, that's awful and where's that heading, right? So I gotta be responsible to myself. And then if you're the person sitting next to me, I have to feel some responsibility for you too, especially if we're under the same roof, we're in the same family, we're in the same community, right? So take responsibility for those things. And that's what, that's what leads us to cast with a wide net, right? Then really enact and live responsibility for the roles that are closer to home. So like an obvious example is parent, right? If parent is part of your responsibility, then live that right? Live that, right? If you're not doing as good a job as a parent because you're depressed and you haven't taken care of your depression or because you're drinking three or four nights a week to soothe the tension and that impacts your kids, or even because you think that the success that you're making in some way is doing things they need when they really need your time and attention. Like there's a million different ways that can be, right? But step back and really take a look at that role, right? Because that's a role you want to really live, right? And then don't feel responsible for everything, right? When people are empathically attuned, conscientious, right? It, it, it's very easy for people to then feel responsible for everything. They're responsible for everything that's going wrong in the family. They're responsible even when someone else's lack of health may be driving all of those things, right? They feel responsible in ways that don't let them go out and strive more because they're taking on unreasonable burdens, right? So, so, Take responsibility for a lot of things. Enact and live responsibility for some subset of those things and don't feel responsible for everything. It's like if we bring that, then we honor the nuances. And you know, if we talk about some political issue or whatever it may be, and I see that, oh, you and I think in a diametrically opposed way, right? If we're doing that, then instead of some reflex that now puts you in a bad category and then wants nothing but confirmatory information, right? I'm like, oh, like, let me, well, like, let me at least learn how you think. Or maybe I'll learn something from you, right? And, and maybe if neither one of us convinces the other one little bit, we have an experience that someone in the other camp can be reasonable, right? I can be reasonable, right? We have a shared human experience, even if we differ. And it's that that we wish to engender. And in many ways, the, the hyper-confirmatory social media, right? And you know, yes, it can be difficult to tell truth from lies, but you know, sometimes one plus one is two and not three, right? So if we're living in those responsibilities and we're grounding ourselves, then we don't choose the thing that's easy. You know, we don't, sometimes I want to choose a potato chip, right? But if I choose it all the time, that's bad, right? So maybe sometimes a person chooses the information that, that, that um, confirms what they want to hear, right? But like, most of the time, don't do that. If you can, don't do it all the time, right? And if you do that, you bear responsibility for that when you have a set of opinions that don't acknowledge that other people could possibly have different opinions, right? Or that there's something other than demons because they have different opinions, then you know, you're in a place that has to come in some way through the lens of trauma, right? Because who becomes that adamant? Right, I must be right, and if you don't believe in me, you know you're demonic. I mean, there's like there are, that's a problem, right? So it comes through the lens of trauma, and it begets trauma. People who don't have all that trauma in them can say, okay, like I I don't agree with your opinion, I don't like your opinion, and I'll actually fight against your opinion. But like that doesn't mean I don't want to give you a helping hand if you've fallen down, right? I mean, that makes sense, right? But we have to step out of ourselves enough and into truth and rationality and shared humanness in order to be able to do that. It's a responsibility. Mm. No doubt. Speaking of humanness, responsibility, what do you think about AI? Is that, do you see a path to that being beneficial or do you see that as um, a race down a path of further isolation? Yeah. I, I have no special knowledge, right? I, I think like many people, I feel a sense of hope, but I also feel very afraid. 
right? And, I think that's appropriate. And and specifically, so why in me is because I talk about AI a fair amount with people and sometimes people will solicit opinions and, and I get to have really interesting conversations about it. And I think what happens a lot, and I know it's not all the time, but, but people come at AI often through the lens of we're going to use some form of logic one way or another to get to a place, right? But humanness, human thought and human decisions are not just based in logic. And in fact, they're trumped by other things. And I think if we're going to create intelligence, we have to honor like what actually goes on inside of us, right? And then we have to be very careful because if we're honoring that and what we're trying to create, it also has great capacity for uh, dereliction of duty to others and perpetration of evil towards others. So it makes me afraid when I think, are we coming at it through some um, overdetermined and overused set of logical processes that ignore the, uh, the more important side of the equation, right? The emotional or the affect, if that worries me, then I think, okay, what if that is honored? That worries me too, right? Um, but I do feel that sense of hope. I, I just think we have to be very, very, very careful because to some extent we're playing with fire when we're playing with human will, right? So if we're gonna make will outside of us or intelligence outside of us, let's be extra careful. I mean, I'm simplifying in, in some ways, but I, I just I think it warrants caution. And I think it's another incentive to really try and understand ourselves. And where does the perpetration of evil come from, right? You know, someone who decides, I just, I'm gonna feel better if things are worse for you. That's a great question. Where does the perpetration of evil come from? Is that, do you think people are born with that? Do you think that it's shaped over time? Well, I think there, there are biological predispositions certain ways. There can be certain characteristics or traits through uh, uh, genetics and the manifestation of genetics. But I, what I believe is far more interesting and the lion's share of the responsibility is the trauma that happens to people, right? Like very few people you know, want to really, really hurt other people when there hasn't been something really wrong in their own life. Right? Which is why the education that, I'm, that I would strongly advocate for in, say, elementary school is not just about, let's help the person, for example, who's bullied, understand the bully. But let's help the bully understand why that person is bullying the other person. There's a lot of people who are bullies at 10 years old are bullies at 50 years old, mm. right? And are they leading companies or governments or families even? A lot, a lot of people are leading families, right? Or they're, they're, they're part of a family, right? how much is their trauma at the forefront? And not always, sometimes it drives people to the opposite places of, of being caretaking and, and, and things that are very, very positive, but it can drive people to reenact the trauma, to wish to have power by reenacting and, and being the powerful person in ways they were on the other side. I mean, that's why people talk about, you know, they'll say repetition compulsion, it's not that, right? And not everybody who's traumatized traumatizes other people, absolutely not. But it's a very, it's a known thing that is that happens with a high degree of frequency, right? And it comes from the terror of being traumatized and then the identification with the aggressor because that means safety, right? So, so I'm just giving one example, right, of where- Why does identifying with the aggressor mean safety? Because identifying it, as the aggressor? Yeah, and there's not a set of logical thought process because often people who are doing that don't actually think that, but they're being the aggressor and they, they can't. That's most of the time put words to that, mm. right? So, so, the, so identifying with aggression or enacting anger. I'm really, really mad at a world that's rejected me. I mean, if you, if you look at commonalities, just for example, in biographies of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, you absolutely see estrangement from a world and then an immense amount of anger towards that world and destructive impulses, right? And you think trauma does so much damage, including in the subset of people who have early trauma that leads to evil. And they're responsible for the evil. This isn't, oh, somehow we're letting people off the hook who are perpetrating evil. But, but does trauma in certain people, in certain situations, you know, take all comers, there's gonna be a significant number of people in whom trauma, especially early childhood trauma, greases the wheels of progress of doing evil. So it is so, so important that we understand trauma, understand what it does to us, start this understanding when we're young. Right, so, so we understand as, as a parents who are raising children, right, in education paradigms of understanding trauma and, and being able to fight against it in ways that I believe, I, I truly do believe can absolutely change the world. I think the majority of awfulness, of suffering that's wrought in the world is wrought through the lens of responses to 
trauma. Yeah. Or people who don't resist those responses, right, because the trauma in them might be leading them to lead, say, with less self-assertion or less coming up against something uh, and asserting themselves than they might, right? So when you see the, when you think about the impact of trauma, and sometimes it gets studied through couples or through family systems, and, and you can often tell, like, oh, here's this constellation within this system, and, oh, th this person's trauma has really you know, really kind of push forward landing them here, and this person is push forward landing them there, and this seed of trauma fell in that sort of fertile ground for this problem or that problem. And it's not always that, but boy, there is a lot of that interwoven into human suffering, whether it's the human suffering from one, you know, enacted from one person to another in a household setting, or it's someone who is, you know, starting a war and murdering thousands of people wholesale, right, for, for you through that lens of trauma. So in a small lens or a big lens, it's all awfulness, it's all suffering that gets pushed forward by trauma and by our responses to it. And furthermore, by the fact that that the, the responses in us are, are often hidden from us and from, their, for, from our ability to understand and change them. The woman who saw the award as a mark of shame and a mockery did not know that she gained from it so much inspiration and strong sense of self, and it led her to do good things that moved her life forward, didn't even know it anymore. So there's, there's so much power to trauma that we see in these examples. They're real examples, and then we think this is going on writ large, and we have the ability to better understand it and to better treat it mm. and to prevent it. Yeah, I mean, the 20th century is replete with I don't know Stalin, but certainly um, many of the other experiments that went wrong from Mao to Hitler um, and seeing the echoes of trauma, if that really is the thing that underlined all of their behaviors is it's pretty terrifying how far that goes, which coming back to AI, there was a book called Upgrade by Blake Crouch, which wasn't about AI. It was actually about gene editing, but it could have just as easily been about AI in terms of the, the premise of the book and spoiler alert for anybody that's going to read it. Um, but the premise of the book is uh, that a woman becomes convinced that uh, humans just cannot make the right decisions and mm -hmm. that all of this trauma, whatever, just emotions basically is how she saw it. Emotions make us do really dumb things, short-sighted things, things that don't play the long game. And so to advance humanity, mm -hmm. um, she's going to create a germline edit to the genes and then propagate it across the whole world through super spreaders. And the upgrade is all intellect. And so she's basically gonna make everybody super intelligent. And by doing that, people would then be able to solve the greatest problems from climate change, whatever. And as it plays out in the book, they estimate that it'll kill a billion people, but that then everybody else will be smart and they'll be able to solve these problems. And the punchline of the book, again, spoiler alert, so if you plan to read it now, would be the time to, to mute uh, the podcast. But um, what the, the the hero of the book ends up realizing is oh my whole life i've wanted to be more intelligent that's a mistake because the second because it's basically a brother and sister the mother upgrades her two kids and the second they become super intelligent they each try to kill the other because they don't believe that they're right. approaching the problem in the right way uh -huh. and then the one who's like pushing all this forward is willing to kill a billion people and so the other guy goes okay maybe this is still hubris uh, but I'm going to do a different upgrade and I'm going to make everybody more compassionate. And so to your point about, OK, what is the stem of evil? If the stem of evil is an emotional thing that then is carrying out, it's it it is accelerated by intellect. You know, as far as I can tell, Hitler was was pretty fucking bright and he was certainly charismatic. And when that's coupled with evil, like you have a very bad combination. So it's not like intelligence automatically makes you human friendly. Absolutely not. And so I think that's what everybody's struggling with with AI is that just because you're smart doesn't mean that you're going to be friendly to humans or friendly to life right. uh, in general. And so then what does become the way to align things? And is that gonna be compassion or something entirely different? And look, alignment is many, many, many three hour long interviews by itself. So trust me, I know that I'm just skimming across yeah. the surface right now, but it's very interesting that 
as people look at the AI problem, that they're coming to that conclusion of what what is the thing? Like, what do we have to do? Do we have to make it love humans? Do we have to make it love life? Is it you know something completely yeah. different? And then somebody who's coming at it from the trauma angle is saying the same thing. Like, if I want to help unwind evil or pain and suffering, um, I'm coming at this from a perspective of love connection. It's a different orienting mechanism, which is very interesting. Um, myself as somebody who's always lamented that I I definitely wish that I was far smarter than I am, mm. that <clears throat> the over pursuit of that may actually not be optimizing the human condition. It feels like it would be, uh, but in reality, the and, and this is certainly, I tell myself this because I believe it and I certainly tell others because uh, my North Star is human fulfillment and flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing that life has to offer you is the love of another human. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing else. So, mm -hmm. you know, people look at my success and I think they're drawn to the, um, the wrong things. In terms of if you were to emulate my life, the one thing I would say, oh, that, that is going to make you happy for sure, would be to emulate my marriage, not mm -hmm. my pursuit of success. That I would actually, I won't, I won't say it's, it's not inherently bad, but it's a very dangerous game. Not falling in love, not cultivating a relationship would be dangerous cultivating a relationship, making that your number one priority, that's gonna reward you. Like for sure, if there's anything that I'm confident in, it's getting good at that. Doing that poorly is mm -hmm. its own nightmare, mm -hmm. literally a nightmare, nightmare. But doing it well is better than doing money well or doing anything else well that I have ever experienced. Yeah, yeah. I wanna start my response to that with, with the example you gave, which I think is, is perfect, uh, of the, the story, right, that edits out Right, anything but intelligence and starts optimizing intelligence. And that's the thing, right? That's the thing that's going to carry us forward. We've edited out what's not that, right? What's not logic and intelligence. I feel so sure that if you run that experiment ahead, if everybody hasn't killed everybody else at some point in time, everybody who's left will have Cotard's syndrome, right? Which is nothingness. That's why we're so terrified by it because the meaning isn't in the logic. The meaning isn't in logic, good, bad, or otherwise. The meaning is in emotion. When someone perpetrates evil, they're angry, they're frustrated, they feel terrible about themselves, terrible about others, it raises emotions in them. When someone sacrifices their life to save someone else or to help someone else, there's an emotion in them, there's empathic attunement, they feel for the person, they feel for something greater than themselves, right? It's it's. It's the affective or the emotional, if we want to put that word to it, that drives all the action, drives all the action. The logic is just adorning it, right? The logic is just the, the structure around it. You know, the logic of the, the pieces that go into the car, right? The, the emotion is the person sitting in it, driving it around and things are happening, right? The, the logic just is the building block, the, the structure of it and the specific pieces of, of what goes into move something forward in, in time, you gotta put gas in the car, you gotta maintain it. Like it's, it's all logical principles, but nothing of it is interesting. What's interesting is like the person in it, what they're feeling in it, right? What they're using it for. I, I'm trying to create an, um, I'm trying to ex explain how like logic is part of the picture, but it's like the styrofoam around the thing that matters, right? In a sense. And I'm not saying logic doesn't matter. We figure things out. We figured out penicillin, for example, like logic matters, but it doesn't make meaning. It's emotion that makes meaning. It's all that limbic affective stuff that makes meaning. And it's that where we want to engender health, right? Where we want to work against trauma and we want to prevent trauma because when people are healthy, they come to a place of gratitude and humility. This is how people are happy. I mean, at this point in time, I have two decades of data of, of intensely working with people across the life spectrum, across demographics. And you say, what's the commonality of people who are, have good lives, who are happy? It's not, what's their wealth status? Where do they live? What's their social status? How many kids do they have? How much money? It's none of that. Do they feel a sense of gratitude? Do they feel a sense of humility? Right? And that comes if trauma isn't weighing on them, right? If they have enough sense of self that even if really bad things have happened to me and I feel like life has been fair to me, right? Can I do something good? Can I go out my front door and help someone? It's that that makes happiness. I see more happiness in people who, ex who from the outside have absolutely nothing than I do sometimes in people that we think have the world. And that's not an exaggeration. 
Right? If we get to a point where we feel gratitude and humility, we've taken care of ourselves. And it's always constructive. Right? The destructive destroys. Right? I mean, look, what did Berlin look like after the Second World War? Right? Violence and destruction outward brings violence and destruction inward. Or at a minimum, it limits us person who may, in a family system, be intimidating everyone around them, there's no life in them or in other people. No one else is expressing any life, and that person doesn't have it in them either. We take the life out of life. Right? But if we don't do that, we understand ourselves as best we can, we strive to be the best we can be, which means understanding ourselves, what's true and what's not true, right? What's, what, what I'm capable of, that I have some faith in myself and I reasonably am gonna try and make myself the best I can be, I'm gonna strive. What are the chances I'm going to feel better about myself and try and make the world a better place as opposed to being destructive? And I think we see that as clearly as math, the idea that there's actually no difference in value between doing good and doing evil. And people say, well, if there's no God and we can't prove that there's a God, whether there is or there isn't, there's a difference. And we see it so obviously around us. Like, what does destruction lead to? Oh, more destruction, right? We see that so obviously, yet we'll still argue against it. And I think it's that that we need to stop doing. We need to be responsible for the very basic facts in our lives, which is why I do believe if we're anchoring ourselves to health going forward, right, I, I've written about anchor ourselves to biological facts, like things we know, anchor ourselves to history, but it's also anchor ourselves to early childhood education. Right? I see a lot from people in positions of great power that they would call my mother to come get me if I did those things in kindergarten. Like somehow we can do that. We forget lessons of that we learn in kindergarten. I don't think let's act in, in the context of the, the most elevated or esteemed education we can get. No, let's start at kindergarten. That's what we need. And sometimes we see people with 15 years of higher education who need to go back to kindergarten or learn those rules. I mean, I don't say that lightly because that's the basic value system in us that leads us to be reasonable, to be compassionate with ourselves and others, and for us not to then either by choice or by stumbling to it, right, just enacting destruction and creating destruction in the world around us. I believe that, and I, I think we see it over and over. And I do think it's self-evident if we step back and we look at it. I think it tells us, I think everything from the science of the, the physics where we have, to, we have to have counter entropy and parts of the universe have a possibility for there to be, you know, there to be a solar system, we plan, it's like, it's so overdetermined to fight against destruction, right? That's why we have a planet, right? Because the, the atoms in the planet and the subatomic molecules aren't atomized across the rest of the universe. Like we're going against the grain of destruction, right? And, and that's no less true as individual humans, as humans sociologically, right, with one another as cultures. I, I believe that to be true. And I think the, I think the truths out there that, that we already have tell us that. I think that's a beautiful place to wrap. Where can Thank people you. follow you? If a person is interested, there's a website. It's drpaulconti.com. It's just D-R-P-A-U-L-C-O-N-T-I.com. And it, it has ways to acquire the book if anyone is interested and feels it could be of help to them. And it has links to other, uh, other appearances on other podcasts. Love it. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. If you like this conversation, check out this episode to learn more. Then what you realize is your capacity to tap into dopamine as a motivator, not just seeking dopamine rewards, that is infinite. And I, I can say with, with great certainty that this is how you were able to build a big company and sell it, how you've been able to build a successful podcast.